Here's Tova. Runners in the middle. Oh, my word. Hassan Kamara, take a bow. I mean, if you're going to score your first Serie A goal, then it might as well be like that. Sure, it is like a melody, and welcome back to another episode of Serie A Spotlight. This is episode 116, and we're your hosts, Matt and Jake, here to talk to you guys about match day 27. Welcome back, bro. Thank you very much. Thank Did you, you have a lovely birthday? Did you enjoy it? I had a very lucky birthday, yes. I mean, on the day I was pretty much working, um, and then I just went out for a few beers after, I think, a one hour and a half session playing table tennis. Um nice. So it was okay in that sense. It was it was good. And then the weekend is where the magic happened, right? You go out for day drinking. You go to the spa, get a nice massage, like get all oiled up, and use the indoor pool, the jacuzzi, the sauna. So ah, uh, quite a quite a lucky birthday. How are you feeling? You you're sick as fuck, no? I'm I'm sick. Yes, man. Um, I've been inside for two days. I've had feverish nights. But but yeah, I'm here. I'm here and I'm ready to go. And I've done my prep and I'm ready, bro. My guy, I mean, how could you not do your prep if you're at home all day instead of at work? I know, you're right? Gonna do your prep. Of you course, know? the problem is trying to stay awake while doing it. <laughs> <laughs> have, did you hear the episode with Alan? Um, not all of it. Um, it's obviously so. It's it's three hours long, right? Yeah. Which is fantastic because I'm I'm sure it's it's great content. I've managed to listen to half of it. Um, I have to extend my thanks to Alan, obviously, for stepping in even on short notice. And I thought he was brilliant, man. He was great. I, man. I, I he thought was he was excellent. So very le- level-headed speaker. Uh huh. Well done, Alan. We'll we'll do it again for sure. Even a segment with Jake, myself, and yourself would be super happy to have you on again. And to be honest, we extend the invite to the rest of our our patron list because they're they're all so well versed about the game. It'll be great to have their insight on the pod. Yeah. So all of our patrons from Alan down to Ed. Of course, it's Alan, Andrew, and the Anthony, Tim. Campbell, Sluge McNoodle, Lena, David, Kyle, Luca, Matthias, Mint, Michael, Tonna, and Ed. Thank you very much for your support. And um, yeah, hopefully we can have you all on eventually. Yeah, thank you, homies and home et, because we do have one home et, um, who we love. <laughs> when it comes to the goal of the week, we've decided... So firstly, not that many goals this week. I don't think there was a single game where a team scored three goals. It's all, if you look at the scores, 2-1, 1-1, uh, one Roma nil. popped off as they have been. Ah, yeah, lately. of course, of course. And that's my game, I should just know <laughs> that. Um, Roma's almost guaranteed um, three-plus goals a game at the at the moment, especially with how Dybala's playing. Yeah. Dybala scored a great goal, a free kick. That's his fourth goal this week, bro. Chuana had a lovely tira, Jira with his left into the top corner. Amazing goal, amazing. Carboni had a Andrea, Andrea Carboni. assisted by Valentin Carboni. Yes, it was uh, Carboni squared. Um, we call it a Carbonara, right? <laughs> Ferguson had a, had a great volley from outside the area against Atalanta, but when there's an overhead kick, especially scored in the manner in which Kamara scored it, brilliant goal. Brilliant yeah, ball. especially when the ball is coming behind him like that. It was a peach of a ball from Thuvan, by the way, who had a fantastic game. Um, but the technique on the bicycle kick to get his first goal in Serie A was stupendous. Yes, amazing, amazing. Still, not my favourite overhead kick we've seen in Serie A. Um, I recently thought about that Leao overhead kick, the one where he seemed to be falling to the ground um, ah. and he extended. Like I believe oh it God. was against... No, Lazio. Lazio was it Lazio the 2 against Lazio I can't quite remember if it was Lazio though um, but yeah that was a funny one he was falling on his ass and he just bicycle kicks it into the yeah. back of the net he yeah. sacrificed a year of goals um, <laughs> for that one but there's also uh, European competitions as you know guys now obviously we're recording this episode on a Wednesday so we know what happened yesterday but we don't know what's going to happen tonight and we don't know what's going to happen on Thursday naturally so Yesterday, Lazio unfortunately fumbled it and lost 3-0 against Bayern Munich. So that victory was very short-lived and it's been somewhat of a devastating week for Lazio. Today, currently, there is Sporting Lisbon against Atalanta, which is currently tied at 1-1 at halftime. I believe Skamaka just equalized um, after some shambolic defending, but he did super well. Um, tomorrow, there's Roma, Brighton and I think Brighton Roma rather. I think Brighton are home. Yes, Brighton are home in the first mm-hmm. leg. There's Milan Slavia Prague. 
tomorrow mm-hmm. and then next week the second leg of the Champions League as well with Inter facing off against Atletico Madrid and the other one is yeah there's also tomorrow there's yes Napoli Barca next week and tomorrow there's also Maccabi Haifa against Fiorentina yes Maccabi um, Haifa we watch them live against yes, the mighty Hamrun Spartans because they had to go through the playoffs for the conference league and that involved the game against the Maltese team Hamrun mm-hmm. Spartans and Maccabi Haifa looked pretty good to be honest compared to Hamrun <laughs> well they they <laughs> absolutely so first Hamrun were doing decently um and then Maccabi Haifa fans decided to throw flares onto the yeah. pitch and then Hamroon fans decided to get a little bit nasty with their chants yeah. and the game was suspended for one hour and 15 minutes that we were spent just waiting there working the next day your your colleague kept bringing us beers <laughs> so I got absolutely demolished like my head was spinning during the game yeah. so that was an experience it was um, Fiorentina should should have that one in the bag of course yeah yeah, I, I reckon so if you guys are new here don't forget to um, follow us um, and rate us wherever you're listening so we're on Instagram TikTok Twitter YouTube so please do make sure to follow us over there give us a rating on any platform you're listening um, to this on and naturally a rating would help as well we can't yeah, have five stars a review would be nice as well because we're really lacking those actually we've got one mm. google podcast review publicly um but then when it comes to facebook or, or just youtube comments in general we don't get too many so it would be nice if you could leave something over there guys yeah i mean it's up to you we can't force you but you know we're two nice guys trying <laughs> try, trying to grow this podcast so you'll be doing something really cool you already <laughs> went through the list of patrons if you guys want to become a patreon and uh, a patron rather and help contribute to the growth of this podcast um it's just 3.99 a month you could find the link in our instagram bio and we will be very grateful and on that note, we can jump straight to the rundown, bro. Yes, sir. We'll start things off with Inter's 2-1 victory over Genoa, which saw Inter extend their lead to 15 points over Juventus at the top of the table. Controversial call for Inter's penalty there, which ended up subsequently winning them the game. Um, Napoli 2, Juve 1 was perhaps quite a shock when you consider that Napoli have recently been through a terrible spell of form and just recently changed coaches um, but they did enough over there to beat Juve 2-1 they were simply just more effective Lazio nil Milan won in a very chaotic game a very rough game which saw three red cards for Lazio two of them which were caused by Christian Pulisic yeah. who did a fantastic job to get those players yeah, riling up. everyone up and um, this was the first time our cover photo featured the referee so yes. congratulations De Bello <laughs> for us for our fellow League of Legends players um, that's a take on Twisted Fate um, the champion over there so yeah keep going yeah, please very very cool bro very <laughs> twist, Twisted Fate of League of Legends Wow. Um, Atalanta 1, Bologna 2 in what was one of the many very crucial fixtures we had over here. Atalanta and Bologna are directly um, competing for that fourth spot and subsequently Champions League. That is Atalanta's second loss um, this week after losing 4-0 to Inter earlier. Um, they're down six points and, and, and uh, as a result of that, significantly down in the table. Monza 1, Roma 4. Not even kidding, Roma are insane at the moment. And to think this is the Monza side that beat Milan four goals to two. And Dybala with another goal and another assist. That's his fourth goal this week after he scored a hat-trick earlier this week on Monday. <clears throat> Pardon me. Verona 1, Sassuolo 0. This is a terrible period for Sassuolo. They now find themselves in 19th place. They're between their third manager in the past three games I believe um, a bit of an identity crisis hopefully some continuity will see them um, improve and they've lost Berardi which is the worst part until of the tour until 2025 bro Achilles which is in absolutely injury, mental terrible yeah. yeah this was as you guys know a relegation six pointer and the following are all relegation six pointers um, there's Empoli nil Cagliari one a shock defeat for Empoli they were on three wins and three draws um, under their new management however Cagliari have managed to stop the Davide Nicola train Udinese 1 Salernitana 1 Salernitana opened the scoring through a fire strike and then Udinese equalized through an even more fire strike Frosinone 1 Lecce 1 these are all mental relegation six pointers bro Frosinone 1 Lecce 1 Frosinone potentially with the chances they had um, 
they could have won this game, but but Lecce did, did enough. And then the final game, we always leave a good nil-nil to the end, right? This yeah. isn't a relegation six-pointer or anything of the sort, but it's Torino nil, Fiorentina nil. Which um, featured a lovely exchange b- between Juric and Italiano, which we will So get wholesome, to. right? So wholesome. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can't Juric wait. just seems like such a nice guy, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, gentle. <laughs> you know, he, he's never been caught cussing out the owners of the club by yeah. there. He's just a... Overall, chill He's dude. a nice guy, you know. Yeah. He's never been caught spying in a tree. No, <laughs> no. his assistant has. <laughs> his assistant has. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious, bro. Yeah. Spying heck. Um, but let's start off, bro. Inter 2, Genoa 1. Inter were coming off 3 4 nil victories in a row. One against Salernitana, one against Lecce, and last midweek, one against Atalanta. Um, Genoa were coming off a 2 nil win over Odinese, and the previous encounter was the last time that Inter dropped points, um, which was last December. Uh, Genoa won Inter 1. That's mm. the last time that Inter wow. dropped points in, in Serie A. Um, Inter have now won all 12 of their Serie A matches played in 2024. They were extra pumped, naturally, as Juve had lost to Napoli the night before. So they looked to increase their lead um, at the top to 15. Genoa, impressively, had lost only one of their last 11 Serie A matches, bro. That, yeah, they've been on a good run, man. Yeah, in general. yeah, and and you know they, they have a great team, great manager, but impressive stuff nonetheless for a newly promoted team. Bastoni was suspended with Chalanoglu and Quadrado injured. Turam and Acerbi were only fit for the bench. Uh, Genoa at full flow, however, Malinowski was on the bench. 3-5-2 for Inter, Sommer in goal. Backline of Augusto, Devray and Pavard. DiMarco out on the left, Dumfries out on the right. And the midfield three of you guessed it, Barella. Actually, you didn't guess it. Barella, Aslani and Mkhitaryan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Chalanoglu is injured. Um with Sanchez and Martinez up front, the Ezbros. Um, speaking of Ezes, it was Martinez in goal for Genoa and also a 3-5-2 formation. The winter, Bani and Vasquez at the back, Sabelli on the right, Martin on the left, and a midfield three of Messias, Badel and Frendrup, Goodmanson and Retegui starting up front together. Now, Genoa started the game off by getting the better chances, actually. They started very aggressively, and they almost opened the scoring um, after Sommer brilliantly denied Retegui's header, and Goodmanson did not react in time to bag the rebound. Um, That was a scare for Inter that could have changed the entire outcome of the game had they gotten a goal so early, naturally. However, in the 30th minute, it was Aslani that opened the scoring for Inter. It was a brilliant and direct passage of play by Inter, almost trademark at this point, um, which ended with Aslani smashing his finish into the roof of the net after a good through pass by Sanchez. That is Aslani's first goal for Inter. And what a way to take it, man. A very good um, Brilliant finish. goal. Yeah. And, and he was, it seemed like he was a little bit nervous before. There, there was one time in particular where he um, fumbled controlling the ball and he gave away another corner. Um, he didn't seem on top of his game, but the way he took that goal, maybe I'm fucking up because it, it seemed like a very confident finish. No, absolutely, absolutely. And two replacements managed to score the, the important goals this game. Aslani and Sanchez with the penalty, of course. Exactly. When Lautaro can't. Sanchez can. <laughs> exactly, and that's exactly what we're getting into now. Six minutes later, in the 36th minute, a penalty was awarded to Inter and converted by Sanchez. Referee Airoldi shockingly, shockingly pointed to the spot after Frendrup slid in and tripped Barella after the Italian had taken his shot. VAR instructed Airoldi to view the monitor, and after doing so, he stuck to his on field decision. Now, after further investigation, certain angles even show that Frendrup made contact with the ball after colliding with Barella. This call was absolutely bizarre. Even the commentator couldn't Mm -hmm. believe it. Um, Sanchez stepped up and sent Martinez the wrong way, scoring his first Serie A goal in two years. I'll just finish the play-by-play and we'll jump straight into that as a talking point. Um, 54th minute, Vasquez got one back quite impressively. Actually, a goal of the week candidate, I would say. Um, Ah, For Genoa, it was the Vrijs header um, that was cleared only as far as Vasquez, who struck a first-time volley from the edge of the area into the bottom corner. Brilliant goal by the man who has started every single game for Genoa this season. Let's jump straight into the penalty. Um, What did you think, first and foremost? 
I thought it was really controversial, man, um, to be honest with you. Um, I think this week saw two controversial calls as well with the whole Milan Lazio one as well. Yeah. Um, but this one just didn't strike me to be a penalty, man. What, what was the official? Have we got a verdict? Has, have, has the comment? Has the referee, sorry, spoken about it since? So I, I, I don't know if the referee spoken about it since, but what I saw is that um, VAR um, have showed data from the end. They explored all angles and it does showcase that. Not that it matters, but he got a touch to the ball. To me, it doesn't even fucking matter if he got a touch to the ball. That is, bro, you know when I say FIFA bullshit. <laughs> when we're playing FIFA, you shoot, I slide, and then fucking... Three seconds later, four seconds later, after the keeper saved it or it went out, whatever, your player trips over mine and yeah. the referee blows and yeah, gives yeah. a penalty. And I say, that's FIFA bullshit. And they've since patched it. Yeah, yeah it doesn't such, even happen in the game it's anymore. It's such bullshit that they've patched it. That is exactly how Inter got their penalty. Now, to make matters worse, he got the ball. Now, what is bizarre to me is that the referee instantly awarded a penalty. The genius. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then VAR caught him off. They're like, whoa, 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 have a, have a look at this. Have a look, G. He goes, he looks. He, he, he looks for one minute and a half, and he sticks to his decision. I, I found it absolutely bizarre, and I'm not one of those to jump on the bandwagon of Marotta League or whatever, but th- this one was bullshit, man. Mm-hmm. This one, to me, in, in my opinion, some... Nerds can come out. Yeah. I don't know the rules better than me and, and, and tell me that, that I am wrong. But to me, this should never, absolutely, absolutely never be a yes, penalty. Yes, I agree. And, and it did kind of tarnish the game a little bit because Genoa were playing really they well. They were in it. They were and in it. they actually managed to score to get back into it. So that, that would have been an equalizer, of course, without the, the penalty. But it's just statistically, man, Inter just head and shoulders above the rest. And usually when you have a team that attacks so much, you're bound to get many calls for penalties. Do you remember Milan and the Scudetto winning season? How mm-hmm. many penalties they were awarded? Yes. Everyone saying, uh, Milan keep getting these penalties. That's because they were Attacking. bombarding the yeah. box. Bombarding yeah. constantly. Right? I get that. Yeah. I get that. So they're bound to get a few decisions in their favor, you know, when mm-hmm. it comes to this stuff. Uh-huh. I just, um, you know, as we always scream for continuity, consistency, transparency, it would be nice um, to, to hear why the uh-huh. referee thought this was a penalty. I'm going to hit you with a kind of counterproductive um, what about ism um, because if that's a penalty Tati Castellanos should have been given a penalty against Milan when Mike um, when there was a, a defensive clusterfuck uh-huh. Mike cleared the ball and after he cleared the ball he clattered Castellanos uh-huh. now the argument is that he got the ball over there but so did so, so did he but whatever yeah, um, honestly, I don't even know what to say. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, for, we'll, we'll. For me, they're, they're both soft. They both shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. Jumping on to another point away from the controversy, um, this was uh, Simone Nzagi's 300th Serie A match with yet another victory, marking his 179th win in the league. Um, where would you rank him with the best managers in the world at the moment? One of the best, absolutely, at the moment for me. Um, when you look at managers who don't get the players and the personnel that they want, mm. he is one of the most successful. Yeah. Because you, it was really smart by Inter to bring him in, to be honest, man, because I was thinking about this last time and how well Marotta can run a, a football club, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and the league, I'm joking. And- <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> is he? Um, yeah, so... He was at Lazio, Simone and Zaghi, a team which every season would get progressively worse. Maybe not worse, but it definitely wouldn't get stronger. Mm. So he didn't really have the backing of the chairman or the owner in Lotito, right? Yeah. Um, Maratta knew the situation at Inter. He knows the financial situation, of course, that they're not able to splash and to upgrade every single position and the fact that they're going to be losing stars. Maratta is the type of player who can bring in good replacements on a budget if even on a budget, mm-hmm. because he brings most of these players in for free. And and Inzaghi has always been the type to manage to get the best out of the players that he has. He showed that at Lazio. He managed to win Coppa Italia trophies with with players, you know, who you would never you'd never think could win mm-hmm. this this trophy. Mm-hmm. 
So, like Jordan so, Lukaku. Yeah, there we go. Jordan Lukaku playing as the left wing back, you yeah. know. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think um, it was very smart to bring him in. I think he's impressed. He's created his own brand. This 3-5-2 formation is... This is what I was telling Alan in the last episode. It's very different to Contest 3 at the back system. Contest Absolutely. is more of a 3-4-3. This has a kind of its own spin on it. It's offensive. It's solid at the back. The defenders kind of act as playmakers. The midfielders can drop deep and play as sixes. Or when they get the ball, they all become tens. It's crazy, yeah. man. The versatility of this In- team. Inter are a super offensive team that never seem to be caught out on a counter. Yeah, How that's it. the fuck is that even possible? <laughs> the way they position themselves as a team, they're always in the right place at the right time. You see that the right players are hanging back when they're attacking, the right players are hanging forward while they're defending. And the thing is, it's so well rehearsed, it's like clockwork. Even yeah. that, that classic kind of... They, they, they could, they have a great passage of play that they could do round the wings with those one twos with DeMarco and then DeMarco overlaps and whips in a dirty ball. Yeah. And these that they do through the middle focused around Barella. It's genius. And the way Lautaro comes back to help out. Um, it's, it, it's honest. The clockwork is the best way I can, I can describe the way that interplay. Yeah. Um, one more note on this game is that despite how good Inter are, Genoa were not scared of them in this game. Genoa went out fearless. They were bombarding Inter with pressure and they almost had success. Had that penalty not been given, had in, in some parallel universe, um, Retegui scored that header or, or Goodmanson got, got the rebound in, it could have been a very different game. And in the second half after Genoa scored, they were looking for that equalizer, bro. They were, they were hungry for it. Yeah, because they they've got a um, they've got a nice cushion, you know, um, from the relegation sides yeah. for now. Um, so they they do afford to kind of go forward and give Inter all they can. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit disappointed. I generally didn't get anything out of this game, but it seems like Giuliano seems to know something about Inzaghi that maybe the other coaches might not, because even as you said, the last time Inter dropped points was against Giuliano, mm-hmm. and they got very close over here to doing it again. So yeah. kudos to Genoa, kudos to Giuliano for yeah. having such an organized side as well. Well, the teams that they struggle against are Genoa, and Giuliano's Genoa, and Bologna. So uh, Motta yeah. knows Inter because you know he's he's played his almost. Well, the majority of his career at Inter, um, and Gilardino obviously maybe from spying in trees and listening to their <laughs> tactics. Um, Inter obviously first 72 points in 27 matches is ridiculous, man. Um, they are on course to beat Juve's record, and I believe the 2014-2015 season, correct me if I'm wrong, give or take, um, um, I believe... Um, they they can't lose another game. They, if they lose another game, then they 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 no longer beat you. Alan said he he did the match. Um, I trust him. I'm sure he did. Um, I'm definitely not doing the match. <laughs> the match is not my forte. But um, but yes, apparently they can only lose one game. Mm. Now, do you, will they manage to do that? Probably not. They're in the Champions League. They've got a comfortable cushion in Serie A. Bro, but they only them. lost one. Like they they've only lost. Yes, one. but now is the time to rest players to you know save some of their stars for the Champions I think, League. I think they can do it, bro. To be honest, is it is it likely? No, but is having sixty nine um, goals scored likely? No. But is they, it they weren't in the knockout round yet. They weren't in the knockout stages of the biggest tournament in the but world. But they had their injuries. They had a massive defensive crisis. True. And now they have Sanchez scoring. They've got Arnautovic scoring. They've uh-huh. got Aslani scoring. They've uh, got Fratesi scoring. Sure, sure. Um, however, remember that now even the easy games are going to become tougher and tougher because these Absolutely. sides are all facing Absolutely. relegation it's threat. Not, it, 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 it is obviously less... The, it, it it's more of a possibility that they don't than mm-hmm. they do, but they can. Is they, is yeah, my point. They, they, they can. They are fucking capable. Do you think it. they will? Um, I don't think they will because, like, like you're saying, and also, I I just never back a team to go undefeated ever because, yeah. especially in the latter stages of the season, you play Cagliari and it's harder than playing Fiorentina. Mm-hmm. Um, at the latter stages of the season, absolutely. So, I I I don't think so. Um, but but I'm not ruling it out. 
I'm not ruling it out. Yeah, um, I, I just, you know, I, I envision injuries happening. Of course, the, you know, the season is long. This is crunch time. You know, I, I imagine that they, that a few players will falter for them. They're, they're going to get a European heavyweight if they if they get past Atletico, which I assume they will. And they'll have to start, you know, resting a few of these guys. And if you go into a game against, for example, I don't know, Hellas Verona at the moment, and you start the game, I don't know, resting Barella, Lautaro, and Bastoni, for example, mm. you know, you risk, you risk dropping points over well, there. Probably and, and I highly doubt they give a fuck about this record, to be honest, right now. They, they have a chance to win the league and to win a cup as well in the Champions League. Yeah. That would be a massive season for them. So I'm yeah. sure that that's what they'll prioritize Absolutely. right Absolutely. So Inter first 15 points ahead, naturally. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm blanking out, Genoa, right? In <laughs> yeah. 12th on 33 points. Now this is a nice little mid-table battle. There's Genoa on 12th, Monza on 11th. Do remember that Monza are the most successful um, debut team in Serie A in their first season in, in uh, since promotion well, actually their first season ever but um, the stat is a Serie B team that goes up to Serie mm-hmm, A they mm-hmm. had the most success who knows maybe Genoa will want to take that that crown off them they are just three points behind them um, and just four points behind Torino and 10th so it's possible yeah, two very exciting teams over there, um, as long as they're not playing against Inter, Monza. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, Napoli played against Juventus at the Maradona, the previous encounter, so Juve beating them 1-0, this happened in December, and Gatti had scored a second half winner, yeah. to refresh your memory a little bit. This went a little bit differently, as Napoli got all three points over here, they had Meret in goal, it was a 4-3-3, back to the Spalletti days for Calzona, right? Yes. This is That's definitely the vibe around Napoli right now. And he also got a yellow card in this game, so definitely, definitely mimicking Spalletti yeah. over here. So Di Lorenzo was out on the right and Matias Oliveira was out on the left with Rahmani and Juan Jesus as a centre-back partnership with a midfield three of Anguissa, Lobotka and Hamad Traore. That's yeah. right, Traore was playing in midfield. Um, interesting tinkering by Colantuono. Yeah, anything not Sorry, to not Colantuono, Calzona. God. Yeah, um, <laughs> Anything not to play Zielinski at the moment. Every single manager they've had have avoided Zielinski like the plague. Yeah, I guess um, he's probably acting like he's got one foot out the door. That must be the case because he's a very talented player. You know, yeah, you'd want to play ridiculous. him. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Politano started out wide. Um, Kvartskeli on the other side with Victor Ozyman up front. For Juve, it was a 3-5-2 formation with Szczesny in goal. Sandro Bremer and Drugani at the back with Cambiazo on the right and Dilling Jr. on the left. Miretti, Locatelli and Alcaraz were in the middle with Vlaovic and Chiesa up front. Of course, Juve are suffering quite a few injuries. They've got De Chilio out, they've got Keane out, McKenney, um, Perrin and Rabio all injured, of course. This is excluding Fagioli and um, Pogba, who have both yeah. been banned. And players like Chiesa and Danilo aren't even at 100%. Yeah, and for Napoli, Cayuste and Ngonj. Um, yeah. had muscle injuries so it all started um, in the 10th minute when Vlaovic missed an unmarked header wide of the post following a lovely cross by Chiesa Juve would go on to get three yellow cards before the 30th minute um, and Vlaovic, Bremer and Cambiazzo definitely a heated affair over there with Napoli bringing it to, to Juventus Di Lorenzo volleyed high after v- being found in space and Samuel Lilling Jr.'s effort was saved by Meret Ling Jr. went over to fire from a promising position, but he failed to hit the target. Vlaovic chipped Mered brill- brilliantly and hit the post after being played in by Chiesa. Yet again, Chiesa must have been really raging at um, his teammate. He's constantly squandering the chances he was yeah. putting him in. <laughs> Gvaratskelia managed to score a fantastic goal with a volley at the near post. And this came in the 42nd minute just before halftime and his celebration was absolutely brilliant as he went for a knee slide and then got up saying I'm staying right here I'm the guy I'm staying here really embracing the role of a leader while Victor Oziman on the other hand really seems um, to not um, it's not like he's not performing well you know Um, he's had a great start uh, since coming back from AFCON this was the first game where he seemed to struggle Absolutely, but um, Gvaratskelia really um, shows that he's here for yeah for not the long run, but definitely for longer than Oziman, who <laughs> kind of has one foot out the I door maybe, already. Maybe Guevara's agent was onto something when yeah, he said what maybe. he said. I won't Good. repeat it because Oziman will have a stroke, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, Vlaovic could have had a first half hat trick. He missed very good opportunities in the first half. And in the second half, the theme would be the same as Miretti and Vlaovic to open the second half by missing chances. Eventually, in the 81st minute, Federico Chiesa scored a lovely sniper storing parity for Juventus in the final 10 minutes. Um, he was found well by Alcaraz, but to be honest, he really had to kind of get his Robocop on and <laughs> pull off a Vlaovic esque yeah. finish from, a, from an awkward angle. A Vlaovic esque finish of the previous games, not of this one, of course. Yeah. Now, Allegri brought on 18 year old Joseph Nonge. Right. Um, Controversial move. Uh, a bit of a strange decision to bring on an 18 year old in the Maradona and such a heated affair. And this player went on to foul Oziman in the area, conceding a penalty. Victor Oziman stepped up to take the penalty. Um, who, he's not very good at them. Let's be, let's be honest. Him Absolutely. and Lautaro are two of the best strikers in the league, but they can't hit penalties to save their lives. He missed it. Um, it was saved brilliantly by Chesney, who's a specialist. Um, the Juve defenders should know that Chesney is a specialist and he shouldn't be flat-footed. Um, they were flat-footed, however, yeah. and Raspadori reacted the quickest to score the rebound, securing Napoli's 2-1 victory. At the end of the game, Rugani skied a golden opportunity in the 91st. He could have become a late hero again, but that would prove to be enough, and mm. that was the game. Bro, I thought Juve played some decent football, and I thought that they created way more than Napoli did. The difference is that they didn't take their chances, right? Yeah. I think when it comes to... Um, if, if, if we could see Juve's game plan coming into this game and whether or not it was executed, it more than likely was executed. It's just mm-hmm. they didn't take their chances. Had they taken their chances, had Vlaovic even taken one of the chances he had in the first half, it would have been a completely, completely different game. Um, I have to say, though, that Napoli, as much as, you know, Juve are always going to give you time on the ball and they're always going to invite you to attack. I just think that a little bit of that spunk for Napoli is back. Mm. Um, too early to tell whether or not this Calzona guy um, is going to improve this team because one victory, be it over Juve or not, is, is not enough of a case study to tell. But I do think that that Napoli had a good game over here as yes, well. Yes, um, the mood, I think he's improved more than anything else. I think um, the fact that they have a manager who was around when they won the league. Absolutely. It just brings them good vibes, you know, good. <laughs> it's a good feeling for them. It reminds them of the good old days. Maybe they think that this guy knows what their beautiful style is all about and he can let them mm-hmm. play with a little bit more freedom offensively. He, he, he was with them up until, you know, eight, nine months ago, last yeah. season. Exactly. You say the good old days like it was fucking 1992. <laughs> but it seems like it was 1992, bro, because that was three managers ago. Yeah. Come to think of it, you know, Rudy Garcia and Mazzari were there. And um, this was a time when the mood was much, 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 much better, practically alien, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've seen uh, Guevara this game looked happier than I've seen him in a while. Yeah. You know, when he wears, he's a player who wears his heart on his sleeve, so you can really tell um, how he's how he's kind of feeling through his football as well. He he had a good game this game and he yeah. led Napoli to a to a well-deserved victory. I still think that their that their game isn't really flawless. They've no, got a few no. holes in the back. Juve managed to split them open time and time again. It was only because Vlaovic was having an off day that Napoli didn't struggle this game mm-hmm. because no, they could have gone the other way completely. I would say the improvements that I have seen in Napoli is simply <clears throat> on the offensive end of end of the spectrum. Um, obviously, again, this case study isn't enough, but going forward, they did seem more threatening than they did over the past two managers, let's put it that way. What do you think about Allegri subbing Nonge? I don't know how to pronounce his name, but what do you think about it? He's 18 I mean, years old, he brought him on at a very difficult time, he gave away a penalty and he subbed him off. He had done the same to Fajoli, if you remember. I mean... Napoli often get gifted these weird moves by the opposing manager. Like, do you remember when Milan brought on Pellegrino yeah. um, against Napoli? And Napoli went on to obviously humiliate him twice, I believe. Um, no, I I thought it was a strange move. Um, I'm just looking at their their bench to see if they had better options. They definitely did. Huh? And, and they did. Um, Caviglia being one of them, for example. Yeah, who... he's young, but he's played at least. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, uh, 
to me it's it's a, a devastating decision um a similar one to maybe the Terracciano one for <laughs> Milan like it's obviously not the stage in which you bring on an 18 year old um think of how they've introduced Yildiz to the fray that that's that's how you start a young guy off um i just hope to god he doesn't get alienated from the team because of because of that because we've seen like Terracciano for example no one even having a look at him anymore after yeah. he gave away that penalty. You see Pellegrino, okay, maybe he should be sent out on loan to Salernitana, but he he, he was. Um, I just hope that they'll start to introduce him in a friendly way, in a way that he can flourish and not, you know, tossing him in when the stakes are high and he gets humiliated trying to defend against Victor Osimhen. He's fucking 18. <laughs> he hasn't even dreamt of playing against Victor Osimhen yeah. yet. It's it was a weird move by Allegri, um, and then to take him out was just typical old school um, Italian management right there. But yeah, bro. Um, also, I don't know if you have a take on why Ozyman and Lautaro are such deadly strikers, and they seem to be able to score from anywhere apart from the spot. I do they, have a take on what, that. What is your take? And and to be honest, I think I think my take is correct <laughs> in that <laughs> sense. Um, Strikers are typically beasts reactionally. Mm. You cross them the ball or they find, you know, half an inch and in the moment they react correctly. Typically, they wouldn't even be thinking. They're just acting out of pure. The word is actually stillness. Yeah. Um, or the flow instinct. state. The flow state. Instinctive. Yeah. That is... You know, now strikers, okay, they typically they also have a cool head, you know, they they pick a spot, they make a decision. But then you give them time to think on the penalty spot with the mind games that come into play as well. It's not an ins- instinctive scenario, which is where they typically tend to thrive. And think of the goals that Ossiman scores. He's typically tossing himself at yeah, the ball yeah, yeah. somewhere in the area, being an agile beast. Um, Lautaro, on the other hand, taking shots from outside the area, um, fucking linking up well with his teammates, being put on a plate, so on and so forth. So penalties, and then you see some of the... Higuain, for example, he got better at penalties to the latter stages of his career, but he was dreadful at penalties before. He's such an instinctive striker. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, man. Um, maybe too much time to think, Sim- as simple as that. Literally, literally. I was remembering, because I, I, I obviously have Osimhen on Fanta, right? Uh, yeah. And the second... He stepped up to... Th- we saw that he was taking the penalty. <laughs> Your mood was I foul, I did bro. not celebrate for a second because I'm like, he's obviously going to miss it <laughs> because he's missed them multiple times and he's up against Shizny. Yeah. I'm like, fuck this. He's going to get me a 2.5. Like, and, and obviously, without hesitation, he missed it. Yeah, bring back the coconut video, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> be careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Napoli, the Napoli admin better be careful. <laughs> You are second with 57 points. Um, as Milan have caught up to them, they're only a point behind. And Bologna and Roma and Atalanta, everyone just keeps flying at the moment. Atalanta have hit a bit of a slump, but the others are coming closer. You need to be careful. Yeah. Um, they need to make this, they need to put this February past them. Yeah, they've they lost need to get three. back to January, dude. They've lost three out of their last six. They've only won one out of their last yeah. six. They've drawn two, they've lost three. And they've won one. The only teams that have won their last six are Inter and Bologna. Damn. So that's Napoli in seventh as well with 43 points. Slowly, slowly climbing back to um, a Champions League contention spot. Of course, the fifth place is up for grabs with the coefficient. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. It should be the case. Um, Italy had a nice advantage. We'll just see how... How Fiorentina do against Maccabi Haifa, you know, those are meant to be free coefficient points. You yeah. Know? See how Napoli do against Barca. Um, but I think the main threat, if I recall, was Germany, right? Yeah, Germany, and, and unfortunately, and the Premier Bayern League, Munich right? beat, yeah. beat Lazio, which is what it is. It was always going to be the case. So you know? we'll see. Also, if you're a listener who knows where we can, f- where we can actually see the coefficient, uh, if there's like a website or something live coefficient, I would love to to know about it. So yeah. please do send it over if you know something. Yeah. Um, shit, we should have really mentioned the new Champions League 
structure that is going to take place as of next year. Um, we'll do that next time yeah, in some yeah. other episode. Maybe do a bit of an explainer of how this is going to go it down. Caught me off guard when I was playing a fem recently. <laughs> Suddenly, I qualify for the Champions League. I open the bloody fixtures and I see this massive league table with like 40 teams. I'm like, what the hell let's, is going on let's here? Let's not discuss it, yeah. but 3 to 1, yes or no. Yes being we like it, no being we don't like it. Okay, wait, 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 no, wait. We don't wait. discuss. We don't wait. discuss. Okay. Okay, overall, right? Overall. Uh, okay. okay. 3, three two, 2, 1, no. Yes. Okay, okay. cool. Okay. For another time, yes, don't worry yes. about it. Lazio nil. <laughs> I really want to talk about <laughs> it. Lazio nil, Milan 1. I've been waiting to discuss this one Um, because honestly, this is a game of football I enjoy to watch. Um, For those of you that just tuned in, like we're live or something, (laughs) (laughs) there were three red cards for Lazio in this game. Two of them, okay, they came very late on in the game, but there were three red cards, which is devastating for Lazio considering... They just started fighting for top four again, and now they've got three <laughs> players missing for the Rudinez again, but whatever. Um, Lazio were coming off a 2-1 loss to Fiorentina, whilst Milan were coming off a 1-1 draw to Atalanta. The previous encounter was a 2-0 victory for Milan, and maybe where Leo scored that overhead kick. Yeah. This game took place on Friday night, as Lazio had to prepare for Tuesday's Champions League trip to Bayern Munich. They had Patrick and Rovella injured, but Zaccagni returned to the starting eleven. Jovic was still suspended for Milan after being an absolute doo-doo head against Monza, with Pobega injured and Reinders rested after becoming a, fri- a, a, a Friday after becoming a father last night. Congratulations, Tiani! Congrats. You don't seem too chuffed for him, bro. What's the matter? He should pass more, man. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Congratulations, <laughs> Tiani Reinders and Mrs. Reinders, or maybe she's a, a feminist and kept her surname, respect her, no matter what she's done. Um, congratulations to both of you. Um, Kalulu and Tomori were available on the bench after several months out, which is beautiful nice. for any Milan to see after so many Kier Gabia games. Um, Gabia has to keep his spot. Gabia has to keep his spot. Yeah, he's been he's been very good. Granted, um, <clears throat> of course, he has been exposed on certain situations, but I think overall he's been fantastic. Um, it's more Kier that I'm, uh, I I need yeah. to see on the bench again yeah. because. He's he's kind of like that veteran player that looks solid overall until he doesn't. Until he's one on one with a tricky player. There's a, until there's a counter. Yeah, yeah. He's good with the ball at his feet, I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. His positional awareness is very good. His leadership qualities are very good. Unfortunately, football is a physical game and you must run in football. Yeah. And when these athletes are charging towards you, Unfortunately, I don't think Kier has got the legs anymore. Obviously, let's not forget the injuries. He recovered from an ACL fucking injury at the age of 34 or however old yeah. he is. And he peaked quite late as well as a player. Yeah, yeah. Like he was at Atalanta, he wasn't even playing. Mm, you know, it's on only when he came to Milan ages. that he that he managed to um, kind of reassert himself into club football. I believe yeah. he was at Sevilla before. Sevilla, so Sevilla he, was, he was a starter. Uh-huh. With the Danish team, he's always been around. Mm-hmm. Um, however, uh, he's hit, he hit a very high level at quite an old age. Mm-hmm. But however, for some reason, whenever Kier is out of the team, Milan are a better team. Um, yeah. I want to say that with full respect about Kier. But when he went out injured and Kalulu went in as a makeshift centre-back, Milan went nine games in a row with yeah. a clean sheet. Another clean sheet, 1-0. Yeah. Um, there was that whole thing and Milan went on to win the league and then he re-entered and it was a mess again. But whatever, obviously it's not just down to Kier. Mm-hmm. 4-3-3 formation for Lazio. Provedel in goal, a backline of Marusic, Gila, Romagnoli and Pellegrini. Two of those players got sent off. Um, midfield three of Luis Alberto, Vecino and Guendouzi. One of those players got sent off. And a front three of Zaccagni, Castellanos and Anderson. For Milan, it was a 4-2-3-1 formation, Magic Mike in goal, and a back line of Florenzi, Kier, Gabbia, and Theo Hernandez. A double pivot of Ben Nasser and Yassine the Dream, with Pulisic out on the right, Leo out on the left, and Loftus-Cheek playing behind Giroud. Now, in the seventh minute, a totally unmarked Vecino narrowly missed the target after a Luis Alberto corner. There was a flick on somewhere, which is why Vecino was in so much space, Um it was a reaction strike. He could have done better, but very, very close. Um, 
Just four minutes later, Lazio wanted a penalty um, in the 11th minute after Manian slid to clear the ball and followed through on Tati Castellanos. Sorry, Lazio, you've got a long way to go until you earn your Inter card. <laughs> um, the first half was all Lazio. They controlled the tempo um, of the game and they looked super, super explosive. I thought Milan did a great job to interrupt their play and to win as much time as possible to calm the game down. In the 55th minute, the first red card was shown to Lazio and it was shown to Pellegrini. Um, He had only just been booked for a foul on Pulisic and he received another yellow card for dragging the American back by the shirt. However, the reason is that Pellegrini thought play should have been halted earlier for a collision between Ben Nasser and Castellanos. So he was trying to shepherd the ball out of play. When Pulisic went in and nicked it on the touchline and he dragged Pulisic down to the ground and Pulisic would have been in a great opportunity over there because he was as well the, the last the line of, of defence. That was Kalini um, on Sakaesk. Exactly, exactly. It was a, it was a second yellow um, mm. which caused him to, to get sent off. Um, I get Pellegrini's frustration, absolutely, because he was trying to do the right thing. But do it better. Um, don't wait for your team to get a throw in. If, if you know it's open play and you want the ball to go out, kick it out because exactly, there exactly. are professionals that want that, to man. win the game. Um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna bow down to Pulisic as a lover of football and I say that's what the game is all about. But at the same time, you have to have that in you. You have to have that winning mentality in you. If, if, if you're gonna sleep. Then I'm going to expose you. And Absolutely. Pulisic did a fantastic job over there to and get Pellegrini sent off. Yeah, and that's just how they do it in Hershey, Pennsylvania, baby. Yeah, baby. Captain America. Yeah, I no, thought he, he was. That. Yeah, he was, he was brilliant there, man. And I think Pellegrini showed his inexperience. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if you, if you think your player is down and you're worried about him and you want play to stop, you kick the ball out yourself, man. You think Pulisic is going to let you run the ball out so that yeah. it's yours. I mean, if you're worried about your play, you don't care if the, the Brother, opposing team gets a, gets a throw and you don't kick you, the ball out. If you tried to shepherd the ball out in a Champions League final and I was playing against you, I would take it off yeah, the of touchline and, and, and go course, to score. Bro, I would fuck you up, dude. And I'd spit in your yeah, fucking that, <laughs> stupid face after There's I been scored. a goal. It's offside. Oh, oh El Bilal would have oh, scored against Sporting. El Bila. <laughs> Um, Milan had the ball in the back of the net in the 74th minute when Leao's cross took a deflection of Mario Gila um, to wrong foot Provedel. However, it was disallowed by VAR as Leao's knee and half his head were offside. Um, and then shortly after, Tomori came on, which was nice to see. He also, for the few minutes that he played, he looked good. Um, so yeah, welcome back, Fikayo, big dick Fik. In the 87th minute, Milan opened the scoring through Noah Okafor. Jovic is clutch, but so is Okafor. Um, Milan broke forward well through Theo Hernandez. He played the ball to Leao. Leao pulled the ball back from the byline to Okafor. His first shot was saved by Provedel. Gila then made a great block to deny Giroud. Um, And Provedel managed to get a firm hand on the third attempt from Okafor as well, but it was too powerful to be kept out. Lazio wanted the goal to be cancelled out due to Pulisic interfering with play. But you are allowed to interfere with play when you are on side. Exactly. Fun fact. <laughs> That's it. Um, fucking El Provedela. What a monster, he just man. kept saving what them and saving And the last one as well. He kind of jumped out of the way. And and it was going centrally. He extended his arm. That, that was a strong hand. Yes, he was very bro. unlucky not to get yes. it. Like, that was a rocket by Okafor. Literally, if that was one of us... We would have broken yeah. our elbow like yeah, yeah, entirely. Yeah. But, Absolutely uh-huh. snapped he's, our arm in half. He is a very, very solid. I had a student, you know, he told me about my arms. Uh-huh. He told me they look like a dog's tail. What the fuck is wrong with you? He's a German, <laughs> he's a German instructor. Ah. So, he, so, yeah, I kind of made a self deprecating joke. I kind of called myself spaghetti arms, you know, kind of like oh, a God, back and forth. Call and you he went, arms and he went ah, no, you know what we say in Colombia? It's like, it's like the tail of a dog. I'm like, ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny in Colombia. <laughs> Really funny people in Colombia. Um, moments later, now this is where all the juice is after Okafor's goal, because obviously 
Lazio thought they were being, they, well, Lazio were victimizing themselves as fuck, right? Because of, um, they thought they should have had, um, a penalty in the first half, which was never a penalty. They thought the goal should have been cancelled out. They thought that Pellegrini shouldn't have been sent off because it was unfair play by Pulisic. Um, so Marusic shoved Leao to the ground. Um, the referee awarded a foul and then he brandished a straight card for dissent. Um, a lot of people say the referee was losing his cool over here, but we've seen straight red cards brandished for dissent, bro. Yeah, it depends on what he said. Eh? It, it is, that, and, and I saw the rule. Um, if you say fucking hell ref or fuck you ref, it's a yellow card. Mm-hmm. But if you threaten or v- speak in a violent nature to the referee, then that's a straight red card, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, verbal abuse is what is what they would call it. Um, after that, this is where... There was a bit of a harsh one. Gwenduzi got a straight red mm-hmm. card for pushing Pulisic to the ground. Um, now, okay, it was a push. At most, perhaps a yellow card, right? Pulisic was kind of tugging his tugging his arm first. Gwenduzi got frustrated, and the push was a rough one. You see, one of mm-hmm. his arms goes on his neck, the other one on his head, like, and he shoves him. So. Right? It, it, it's, it's a harsh call, but I've seen many an article say that the referee lost his cool, lost his head. I yes, don't this, think, this I don't think. One, I don't know of Guendouzi. It, it's, it's very harsh, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't go so far as to say that the referee lost his head because Lazio were poking and prodding in those last five minutes. Um, in those last five minutes, they, they, they were being Annoying. They were being mm-hmm. bitches, unfortunately. Sorry for any Lazio fans that are listening. But what what are you going to do? Let them get away with everything? The Guendouzi one is harsh. Um, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that the referee lost his head. Uh, um, more than lost his head, I feel like he lost control of the game. Um, simply because of the way Lazio reacted mm. to the decisions that were made. Um, as you said, right, they played the victim card. Yeah. They 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 were they were screaming scandal, you know, and Romagnoli at the end was screaming scandaloso, scandaloso, scandaloso. Um, however, however, if we're being completely honest, okay, maybe the one on Guendouzi was harsh. Yeah, I'll go so know, far as to say that don't probably know, shouldn't have been a red card. Yeah, we don't know um, what Marusic said, but let's assume that he said something that warranted a red card, right? If he mm-hmm. got sent off, he didn't uh, complain, no, Marusic. No, he, he didn't. He walked go, off. So God knows what he said after. I, I'm not sure if it was towards the end of the game or after the final whistle, but there should have been more red cards, man. At one point, Luis Alberto went head to head with Adli and yeah. kind of like, I wouldn't say head butted him, I'd say he pushed his yeah. head away with his head. So yeah. it's kind of a mini head butt, definitely deserves something. You see, Hisai throwing an elbow out, hitting, yeah. hitting Giroud, I think it was in the yeah, face of his elbow. So. So there were many things that the referee actually didn't see. But yeah, bro, Lazio uh, lost their head. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but that that's the way it is. What what can the referee do? Mm-hmm. You know, if they're going to keep on... What happens when you're a teacher and your kids keep on misbehaving, keep on misbehaving? You're not going to ask them to leave the classroom. You're not going to give them a break-in or, or whatever. And unfortunately, that that's what the referee had to end up doing. Again, I'll, I'll reiterate, the Gwenduzi one was very harsh. Um, but it was the fucking ninety fourth minute, or, or or whatever. Yeah, um, I I think that it was very naive by Lazio, and they really threw away potential points over here because they were better than Milan. Absolutely, they were much better than Absolutely. Milan. Absolutely, especially in the first half. In the second mm-hmm. half, they played the majority of it with with ten men. Um, subsequently down to eight after the ninetieth. Mm-hmm. But aha, uh-huh, it, it's. The, the, unfortunately, Lazio, to me, they showed great inexperience. Yes, and uh, Milan, on the other hand, stayed calm the entire game, kept their cool. You see, yellow cards were brandished to many Milan players. Pulisic got one, Leao, Adli, Florenzi, Gabi, Ateo. They all got yellows, but they all stayed calm, man. They yeah. all stayed calm, and none of them... They, they put the team first, and, and this is quite unlike Milan this season because Milan love a red card this season Absolutely. you know so the discipline hasn't been great but this game it was and Pulisic I think deserves all the credit this game some of that what is it CONCACAF shithousery ah. you know for the USA <laughs> playing in these fucking weird games where you have to shithouse your way to a victory um, came in clutch here for Milan 
and and yes, um, Pulisic put the team on his shoulders and guided them to victory, in my opinion. Uh-huh. As he often does, um, and, yes. and we said this, he, he has been the catalyst for that US national team for so many years. He's still only 25 years old, you know what I mean? Um, and, and now he is carrying Milan, essentially. Um, one thing I also want to say is that keep in mind when it comes to Milan that this is virtually still a very, very new team for Milan with Loftus Cheek, with Adli, with Pulisic. Um, typically as well, there's Reinders over there. Considering that there are so many new starters to the starting 11, Milan being in third place and winning games like this and showing great experience when doing so, I'm quite impressed. Mm-hmm. And after two, three seasons of this team gelling, I think they can do some serious damage because they have a team of serial winners. Mm. Um, but, yeah. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully agree with the team of serial um, winners. This will spark quite a bit of a debate. <laughs> uh, I, I think the mentality can be a little bit fragile at times, man, with, with mm. Milan. Um, not Obviously not always, but at the end of the day, this is a young team and it very much depends, I think, on the mood, on the opponent. Um, on who's actually out there playing Um, because we saw for example in the Europa League the second leg I think Milan demonstrated a little bit of a fragile mentality almost letting that slip um, conceding early um, losing the game when in reality they could have just held the 2-2 How, however um, I, I get what you're saying but I'm talking more about the mentality than than the results on the pitch Um, I think this team like, like they when I say serial winners, I mean the attitude of the players. Now, I know that there there have been certain instances where Leao's work ethic has been critiqued when Giroud spoke to the media and said we didn't know whether to attack or defend yeah. against Napoli. We have seen a bit of that, and that's going to come when the team is going through a tough spell, mm-hmm. particularly with Pioli being under fire, um, um, the team still gelling together. But you see the attitude of the players when the tough gets going, um, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Yeah, is what yeah, I'm trying to yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, definitely. Um, you know, I, I would say so far the season has not been too disastrous for Milan. It's not as disastrous as many fans are saying it is. You know, they're firmly in top four. They're in a European competition. They're unlucky to be out of the Champions League after getting the most difficult group that yeah. was. Possible to get, mm-hmm. um, literally the group of death, as it was, as it was Fucking named. Dortmund, Newcastle, yeah. PSG. Um, shame about the Coppa Italia, but that's that's pretty much a shame. Shame that um, Milan still um, haven't really figured out what to do against Inter. Yeah, and uh, um, I think it it is the end of a cycle with Pioli. I think I wouldn't be opposed to a new manager, definitely. Um, just simply because he's been there for so long, and I think he's achieved a fair amount. I just hope that the new manager is a progressive attacking manager because this team has the making of being a fucking attacking unit, man. Um, with Pulisic, Leao, Loftus Cheek, Ben Nasser, um, with the prospect of Zerg Zay coming in as well. Theo Hernandez on the left. Obviously, some of these players, um, could leave next, next season. Who the hell knows? Um, but th- this team is definitely made to be an attacking side and not a not a pragmatic one. At least, one. look, man, the the names that are being linked to Milan are Deserbi, fucking Deserbi, who apparently um, is obsessed with Milan, and like he's a massive Milan fan. This You're guy, kidding me. and the headlines are all saying Deserbi might just be crazy enough to go coach in Italy. Of course, crazy enough because the salary won't quite cut what he can potentially Absolutely. make, right? But Don't uh, tell me this shit because bro, I'll hang up a Deserbi yeah. post uh, <laughs> tonight. <laughs> um, Motta, who is doing God's work with Bologna, like Juve they, want him. Juve, Juve want, want him. him. I think everyone, heavily. Everyone wants Motta at the moment. Yeah. And Conde, who Zlatan is pushing for. The least. Now, the, to me, my, my uh, least favorite idea, but same. Also a serial winner. Yes. So at least the replacements that are that are being mentioned are all very exciting. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we've seen, man, we've we've been through so much. We've been through so much. <laughs> jump, jump, Paolo. Are you talking yeah, about yeah. us or Milan? Oh, no. Mil- <laughs> Milan fans in general, bro, man. When it comes to appointing a new manager, there, there were the there were a Paolo few years, bro, so, man. bro. Fucking hell. Clarence Seedorf, Pippon, Zaghi, Brocky, Gattuso, Brocky, just. 
coaches who are not qualified, man, who, who are not at that level. Even Montella, yeah. to a certain extent, was, was, was nowhere near good enough. Um, so it's just nice to see that Milan have really changed, man. They've come yeah. a long way. Ever since the 5 0 against Atalanta when Pioli took charge and Zlatan came back, it's been a different story yeah. for Milan. Firmly, firmly top three. Firmly top three in, mm-hmm. in Italy. And the reason I'm saying that with my chest is because Milan haven't been firmly top six in a while. Um, you know, Milan last season finished in fifth, to be completely honest. Thank Thanks to Juve is why they got a lifeline. The season before, okay, they won the league. The season Mm -hmm. before that, they were second. That's when shit started to change. Before that, they had gotten Champions League for the first time with that 2-0 victory, double Kessi penalty over Atalanta. Before that, it was a nightmare. Yeah. It was an absolute nightmare. And last season, by the way, could have been a nightmare as well, as as you correctly said. So last season was, was, to be honest, quite a failure. Mm-hmm. For, Absolutely. for Milan and but for Milan Pioli especially. What, what the Pep Guardiola says this is like, after you win the league, change, shake it up. After you lose the league, change, shake it up. You have to stay fresh. Yeah, you, you have mm. to bring in new players. You have to change the system. And unfortunately, Milan stayed with the same recipe that won them the league. Um, and they suffered as a result of that. We saw something similar with Napoli in that regard. Okay, mm-hmm. they changed manager, but the manager tried to almost replicate the the exact same thing that Napoli were doing. And as a result, they struggled. You have to keep it sexy and you have to keep it fresh. Look at Inter with Thuram, for example. Yeah. You know. But anyway, Milan, third place, 56 points, just one point behind Juve. Lazio... Still struggling, man. Ninth place on 40 points. Two behind Fiorentina. And they are six points behind a Europa League spot. Which is weird. Because they're a good team. And they play well. They just can't do it consistently. Um, Sarri and Lotito's relationship is as sour as it can possibly get. Um, He's always complaining about transfers. Um, Lotito tells him shut up and do your job in public essentially <laughs> it is definitely um, what did you say not sexy not fresh <laughs> and that's, Absolutely. that's what they have to still, do the, the, also a team that's still gelling together um, also where is Luis Alberto where, where is, where where is, is Luis? Luis Alberto <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, he can't do it all on his own I have to apologize to Lazio fans because I feel like I've been really rude about yeah. Lazio in this one so ap- apologies to David for Matthew yeah. absolutely roasting your favorite team. Of course, David being one of our patrons, um, who is one of the funniest people in the chat, uh, by absolutely. the way. He kills me. What did he call Pedro last time? He called Pedro. He said, nowadays, Pedro's a chubby little cunt. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching the Bayern game. I'm like, his accent definitely has to come on. But what other options are you going to bring on of the bench? Like, you're going to bring on Tati Castellanos? I always, bring on I always Pedro, like... thought that Pedro looks like a waiter. I <laughs> always thought that in my head he looks like he should have an apron on, a black... What's a sidri? Uh, in, um, uh, it's a, waistcoat, a, waistcoat, a black yeah. waistcoat and a black tie. Yeah. That's what he looks like he should be wearing. And like he'll he'll have his arm out and he'll have the cloth over his yeah. arm. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. You know, he's, he, he uses probably like Kuhn Green to do his hair. I think that is um, Kuhn Green. He goes to the barber and he tells him probably trim. Yeah. You know, like nothing else, mm-hmm. trim. You yeah. know, short on top, shorter on the sides. He clean shaves, apart from when he leaves a bit of a moustache. I think nowadays living in Italy, he might leave a bit of stubble. So yeah, mm. waiter vibes, absolutely. Whereas yeah. Dave said, chubby little cunt vibes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of waiters are chubby little yeah. cunts, unfortunately. By the way, Bayern fucking destroyed Lazio. It's a real shame in yeah. that second leg. Um, Chiro Mobile missed such a good chance, man. Yep. Oh my God, he missed such a good chance. It would have been 2-0 been up at that point. Yeah. It could have changed everything. But yeah, the next the game... The Atalanta game finished 1-1. Yes, yes, 1-1. And um, Atalanta were actually pretty good towards the end as well. Lukman hit the post, I was seeing. El mm. Bilal scored um, offside, but um, or there was a foul or something. I'm not quite sure what happened while we're recording. It's difficult to watch. Yeah. But yeah, definitely good. Atalanta played against Bologna yes. and lost 2-1 at home. Um, and that is the second time they've lost to Bologna this season, as back in December... They lost to a Ferguson 86th minute goal. So it's the Scotsman who um, has sunken Ladea again. 
For Bologna, it was a 4-1-4-1 kind of formation thing that they have going on with um, Skorupski in goal, Christiansen on the left, Posh on the right with Calafiori and Beukema as a centre-back duo, Remo Freuler playing in front of the defence with Dan and Doyle on the left, Ricardo Orsolini on the right, Luis Ferguson and Fabian playing behind. Joshua Zergzi. Hold on, look at that 4141 formation. Yeah. And think of it as a 272, with the two being the um, left winger yeah. and left back. The l- Look at that seven in the middle, how you have it's Freuler Zerg- bang on in the middle, Skorupski on the far right, Zergze on the far left, and then Orsolini and, and Posh on the, on the far right. Um, he's not kidding around. There, there are so mm-hmm. many variations of this 272, um, Motta system. Yeah, what a and, hipster though, reading yeah. the right way. But bro, it is a perfect amalgamation of, <laughs> That's a good word. Huh? I use it word. so much at work. Really? We amalgamate the app and social media. It's crazy, bro, when I say it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fucking when insane. When I say this word, bro, you see everyone. Complete. <laughs> it's, it's basically an amalgamation of the app and our social media. Um, Damn. What the fuck was I going to say, bro? It's an amalgamation mm. of Gasperini's Genoa and Mourinho's Inter which is the two main teams in Italy that he was involved in, and he said that publicly, so he ain't kidding around. Damn. For Atalanta, it was um, another strange formation, 3-4-1-2. Not that strange. Are you sure it's not a 2-6? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, it's a 3-4-3, but the other way. (laughs) So, Karnaseki was in goal, yes, Scalvini, Jim City, and Kolasinac were at the back with Zappacost on the right and Ruggeri on the left. With Coop Miners, Derun and Pasalic playing in the middle. Um, Dick Etelara and Lukman started up front. So in the first half, Ruggeri's cross was met by CDK, but the shot flew over the bar. Zappacosta's shot was saved by Lukas Skorupski later on, and Lukman scored on the rebound. And that would be in the 28th minute for Atalanta to get a well-deserved league to be, lead, to be honest, as they started off um, better than Bologna. And Bologna were pressing high, and Atalanta were really taking advantage of the space left behind. In the second half, the story would be different, however. Karnasecki pulled off a wonderful save to deny Calafiori's point-blank header. Salamakers won a penalty after being brought down by Tion Coop Miners. He had just been introduced, Salamakers. Um, There was a double whammy. Um, by Motta and in the 46th minute he brought on yeah. Salamakers and Lukumi for Orsolini and Posh and they had an instant impact especially Salamakers who was really threatening um, yeah he won the penalty Coop Miners pulled him out pulled him down naively and he knew it was it was stupid as well you could see from his reaction um, Zergzi stepped up and took the penalty as cool as ice and scored it his penalty run up is, is cool man chill it's, it's, chill, it's chill but it's not over the top Mm. You know, it's still he still hits them well. Yeah, it's not like he stops and stutters too much. Such a cool guy, man, Joshua. And the celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, he walks his dog every morning with a guy. Really? There's like a day in the life video on YouTube. Watch it. He's so chill. What dog does he have? Fuck. Does Um, it match his hair? No, no. It's like one of those like like Labradors or something like that I think mm. a very normal just generic thing. dog like yeah, you Google just, dog that, exactly that dog. exactly okay. that kind of dog okay cool Google, Google Xerxes dog you go on nice <laughs> so yes uh, Ferguson completed the turnaround with a volley from outside the box into the bottom corner in the 61st minute um, you know he's Atalanta's worst nightmare right now Lewis Ferguson who's yeah. been doing so well captaining this Bologna side he's one one to watch for any Scottish um, people out there who want to keep an eye on their players playing overseas. He's probably one of the most impressive right now. Um, Ferguson, we really don't praise him enough. He's a fantastic player, Ferguson, man. I, I, I honestly think that um, he must be the most underrated player in that Bologna team. And the reason I say underrated is because Bologna always have very marketable key pieces to talk about. But the thing is that once these marketable new pieces are coming in, like Orsolini had a breakthrough season last season, Zergze this season. In the meantime, throughout all of that, Ferguson has just been consistent from yeah. the day that he signed, man. Goal scoring midfielder, his defensive duties are there as well. Obviously, hard worker, very hard worker. He gets many an opportunity, him and Fabian, because of the way they play with Zergze hanging back, allowing the midfielders to go through, Orsolini and Dan and Doyle coming centrally. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, it really is. Um, Gasparini made four changes within a five-minute span. 
Um, they increase the pressure, they being Atalanta, of course, trying to find an equalizer, but poor finishing and the resolute Bologna defense prevented them from snatching a share of the spoils. Mm. Um, Bologna, man, I'm just blown away. Week after week, they keep blowing me away. I keep thinking this dip's going to come. Mm. It never does. And they, they had a small one. They had a small one. Six games uh, and I thought there. it was going to get... It was going to go from bad to worse for them, but it really hasn't. And um, yes, I'm so sorry for season one. You know what it is, bro. You're, what do you mean, so sorry for season one? You remember season one when Motta was at Spezia ah, and was shitting on him? You hated him, bro. Thing. You hated him. Um, what was I going to say? Um, Bologna, the thing is, bro, you can't defend against them the reason you can't defend against Bologna is because you think you're gonna mark Zergze and all of a sudden you're marking Remo Freuler and yeah. Zergze is running in at the at the near post you think you're marking Orsolini and all of a sudden you're you're fucking marking Fabian the the way that they shift around they're so unpredictable in their attacks their shape is constantly constantly changing when they defend it's like a 4-5-1 formation and the thing is their counter-attacks are so smooth because what do they do Zergze always when defending he stays up right Mm -hmm. if they're defending on the left hand side or Solini is up if they're defending from the right hand side Dan and Doi is up Mm -hmm. so when it comes to the counter-attack they constantly have a player in space. And then you see the midfield two charging up and Zergze dropping back. So they think they're marking Zergze and all of a sudden, instead of tracking back to mark the striker, there's no striker and you see those two central midfielders and the two wingers charging directly yeah, yeah. at you. And they overwhelm, but they don't overwhelm in a way where they lose their shape, so on and so forth. Kind of similar to winter in that sense. Mm-hmm. But they're so unpredictable with who is where at what given time. Like, yeah. like you have to zone the mark against them. There's no other option. Absolutely. And, and this was a ballsy approach against Atalanta. Could have gone quite bad in the first half um, with the space they were leaving behind pressing. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, absolutely, bro. When, when Zergzi drops deep, man, he's the type of player, man. If you give him the ball, he can pick a player out. He can Easy. waste a player and charge. He can just, you know, he's so good at hold up play, he's so complete. To think that this player was worried coming into the season, I spoke to Motta, he said that, listen, I'm not a solo number nine. Mm. I'm not a lone striker. I'm a second striker. He and Motta technically told him, is, bro. Motta, yeah, he, te- he technically is in the system. But, um, but yeah, man, Motta managed to util- uh, utilize him to perfection. He's the perfect player for him. To think that Bayern Munich spent all the money on Harry Kane, man. Uh, right, when they could when have they had could have fucking Jos was their Xay, baby. Um, another thing I really like is when they're exercising this, this 272. Sorry, I've, I've totally geeked out on Bologna yeah. recently. <laughs> um, Calafiori, who obviously it, it was a risk playing him at center back. But when they're on the ball, he is absolutely not a center back. He's yeah. playing exactly next to Remo Freuler and he's in that creative role. Their other center back, and I shit you not, is Skorupski. <laughs> I swear to God. Because yeah. what happens is they go into a double pivot with Calafiori and Freuler. Belkem always stays back. He's that last yeah. man. Skorupski, you'll see him, bro. Always next to Belkema. They yeah, play the ball to... Uh, exactly. Oh, goalkeeper, sorry. Literally, literally. He, he becomes a centre-back in that scenario. Um, there are so many videos on, on, on YouTube and on TikTok that you could watch, guys, that delves so much into this very unique team and the way that they play. And and honestly, you won't be able to get your mind off it. It's so interesting. Yeah, um, honestly, they've. I, I did not expect them to win this. Their away form has been the only thing this season that hasn't really matched anything else. But fucking hell, they really stepped up to the plate. They love a big game, mm-hmm. these Bologna players. They love a big game. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. Atalanta, on the other hand, have gone a little bit limp lately. They were on the up. They were on a six-game winning streak before the draw against Milan, and they went on to lose 4-0 to Inter last week. Their confidence has definitely been shot. Um, They rested players in the Europa League today, Mm -hmm. um, meaning that obviously they're prioritizing the league. What do you think about that? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, Especially with that fifth Champions League spot potentially, right? For yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I think you have to. I think morally as well, um, not morally, um, for their confidence, mm. it's important that Atalanta get top four. Um, they've been dancing between eighth, seventh, sixth <laughs> for too long, and they're they're a team that deserve to be in the Champions League. They're they're fantastic. They're so clever. They're super talented, and they they deserve more. Unfortunately, there's always one period where they become inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, they just don't have that that edge at the moment. Mm. Um, Atalanta. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but Bologna having a freak season, and I can't remember um, the last time a team finished top four that he didn't I think it was Atalanta Atalanta were the last surprise yeah, Champions yeah, yeah. League quali- qualifiers I in, in so. Italy but yeah um, I remember once I remember I barely remember but I remember once Udinese had done yes, something the, they came yes. second I think of Udinese course. and that, that was, was the, that's when season. Milan won the league I think I think so yes in, when Milan won the league with barely scoring any goals I believe but mm. they conceded even fewer something ah there was that yeah so Bologna are in fourth with 51 points. Um, just to give you an idea, fifth are on is Roma on 47. So they've cut, um, they give, they've given themselves some breathing room over there. Um, on the other hand, Atalanta are in sixth with 46 points. This was a Champions League six-pointer if I've ever seen one. And yeah. Bologna totally, totally, totally deserved it. What a, what a performance by them and to manage to not only come back into the game, but find the winner through Ferguson. Yeah. At the end, yeah, great balls. Um, Monza one, Roma fours. Next one we're going to be covering. We'll try to do this one a little bit quicker because I really want to discuss this relegation battle. And there were three or four fucking relegation six pointers. So let's skim through this one a little bit. Monza were coming off a two 0 away victory over Salernitana. Roma were coming off a three two home win over Torino, where the Bala scored his hat trick. The previous encounter was Roma one, Monza nil. Um, you know. Mourinho's Roma. Um, Karsdorp and Abraham were still out and the only absentees for Roma, while for Monza, <coughs> pardon me, it's so being sus- rude, it was, me, it was my food. It so was suspended, plus Caprari and Vignato being the long term absentees. It was a 4 2 3 1 formation for Monza with the Gregorio on goal, a backline of Carboni, Mari, Caldirola, and Berindelli. Bondo and Gagliardini in the pivot with Mota and Colpani flanking um, Pessina and Juric up front. Uh, 4-3-3 for Roma, Svilar once again in goal and the backline of Christensen, Mancini, Indica and Angelino. Cristante, Paredes and Pellegrini in the midfield with Dybal and El Sharawi flanking Romelu. Juric hit the near post with a header in the 15th minute following a Colpani cross as it was a decent start for Monza. However, in the 38th minute, Pellegrini opened the scoring. Lukaku laid the ball off to Pellegrini who skipped past Berindelli sensationally before slotting into the bottom corner from just inside the area. Great technique by the captain and just honestly, at the moment, Pellegrini and the ball are two of the best players and most creative players in the league. Yeah. 41st minute, Lukaku got his first goal under Daniel Leder Rossi. He finished off a low cross by Dybala following some great work by the Argentine to create the chance. In the 63rd minute, Dybala scored a free kick and his fourth goal of the week, um, including the one assist. He struck an inch-perfect free kick into the bottom corner from around 25 yards out. Um, in the 82nd minute, Paredes bagged a penalty. The Argentine sent the Gregorio the wrong way with an unstoppable penalty, hitting the crossbar and going into the top corner. Um, the, uh, the penalty was awarded after VAR spotted Bondo wrestling Huys into the ground. In the 86th minute, Andrea Carboni got a sensational uh, consolation goal from some distance, smashing the ball into the top corner. Um, not much to discuss in the sense that Roma obviously overwhelmed Monza to a point where Monza, they had no right, they had no opportunities to fight back. Um, you know, in the 38th minute and the 41st minute, Monza are entering the second half. They're, they're entering halftime rather super demoralized. And then by the 63rd minute, the ball out a moment of magic. Um, then they lose their heads. 82nd minute, Paredes nails a penalty. You know, they, they give a penalty mm-hmm. away, a, a very silly one by, by Bondo. So it's obvious that Roma went there and overwhelmed them. However, one thing that might be going under the radar over here is Roma's chances for Champions League. 
Roma are in fifth place on 47 points and they're four points behind Bologna. Um, they're actually above Atalanta by one point. Now, I'm going to read you the remaining fixtures and you tell me the likelihood. Um, okay. Fiorentina, Roma. Okay. Roma, Sassuolo. Lecce, Roma. Roma, Lazio. Udinese, Roma. Roma, Bologna. Napoli, Roma. Roma, Juve. Atalanta, Roma. Roma, Genoa. Empoli, Roma. It's good to... <laughs> Okay, so not, a, not an easy stretch. No, there's, no, there's definitely not. fucking three, four games in a row over there. Roma, Bologna, Napoli, Roma, Roma, Juve, Atalanta, Roma that are devastating, uh-huh. to say the least. I I feel like I don't know Roma, so I don't know if I can comment. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, obviously, from what I've seen so far, I would guess that they, they would confirm that fifth spot. But, however, Atalanta are right there, and Atalanta are no joke, and Napoli are right there, who are no joke either. Mm. Um, especially uh, with, with the performance they've just had over, over Juventus, the return of a manager that they're finally happy with, um, third times the charm. <laughs> but, but uh, um, when it comes to Roma system, I saw something quite interesting, bro, that De Rossi is inspired by Guardiola mm. in a way that he is tactically rigid for three quarters of the pitch. Mm. But once they skip that three quarter mark, the players have maximum freedom of expression where they can do whatever they want. Is the, 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 the quarter being the defensive quarter the, 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 for the, Roma? The offensive quarter. They can do what they want ah, offensively. Okay, okay, yes, okay, exactly. So, so they kind of went from a manager who tried to control everything Mm. who tried to control their every move, kind of spoke to the media about his team not being of, not being good enough to play a four-at-the-back system, not being go- good enough to play an offensive brand of yeah. football, to this manager, De Rossi, who is tactically capable from what we've seen. No, he's got, mm-hmm. he's got a system that works, but then he gives you full freedom at the end. Yeah, he's so not a paranoid narcissist. Yeah, so... so, so <laughs> So it's kind of like, bro, it's kind of like a girl who has really strict parents, uh-huh. you know, and goes goes away, and suddenly her parents are out of the way, and she's got all these dudes, and she's just going, one, two, three, four. That's what, Five, that's six, what, seven. That's what Roma are doing right now, bro. These players are rebelling let's, against their, their strict parents in Mourinho. Let's put it in a, in a more family-friendly way and just say... The Rossi gave Roma their wings. He gave them their wings, dude. They gave them their wings. He gave them their wings, and boy, are they fl- are they flying? Bro. They're fucking. Oh, oh! <laughs> that's that's Roma right now. Yeah, bro. Roma are the Lazio eagle right now. Mm-hmm. No, but that that's a great point that you make, bro. That's very controlling. Um, Mourinho had a very controlling style. Um, and he would berate them. He'd say, okay, like he'd say, I love my boys. I, mm. You know how many debuts I've given in Roma? It's true. He gave many players their mm. debut. It's true. But man, he would criticize their ability. They're shit. Yes. They're shit. He'd be like, oh, you think Sanchez would be here if he wasn't always injured? And mm. Dybala? No, mm. they wouldn't be here. Or Lukaku? Like, what are you saying, bro? So you saying they wouldn't be here. That, that's, a, that's a good thing. Imagine mm. you go to work and your boss like, you wouldn't be here if you were better. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, boss. Cheers, really, man. Really, that's an all right guy. Yeah. But obvious, honestly, I didn't think it would be this way for Roman. I don't think any of us did. The only one we did was Chesco and we all thought he was insane. So Literally. shout out to Chesco. I, I still think Chesco's insane, to be yes, honest. Same. But but he, he got that one right. Roma are in fifth on 47 points, whilst Monza are in 11th on 36 points. Yes, precisely. Now we can start with the juicy stuff, bro. Yes. Hellas Finally. Verona 1, Sassuolo nil. Here we fucking go, bro. It's getting bad, huh? It's getting Here bad for Sassuolo. And They're it's not only this result. trouble, bro. They've lost Berardi, bro. They're so in trouble, fucked. man. Yes. So, um, the previous encounter was a 3-1 victory for Hellas Verona. This came in September. Berardi scored two. Hmm. Benamonti scored one. And Ngonj scored one for Hellas Verona. That is so poetic. So poetic. So poetic. Now, um, A, they get rid of their best player who scored in the reverse fixture yeah. in Ngonj. And they actually win. While Sassuolo, of course, lose their, their hero in the first leg. But yeah, um, Hellas Verona. Not waving but drowning. Lined up in a 4-4-2 formation. 
love it. Montepo <laughs> was in goal with Chachua on the right, bless me. Kabal on the left with Davidovic and Coppola as a centre back partnership. Suslov was on the right and Lazovic on the left with Serdar and Duda in the middle. Noslin and Henri started up front. For Ballardini's Sassuolo, it was a 4 3 3 with Consigli in goal. Pedersen as the right back, Doig as the left back with Ferrari and Derlich as the centre backs. Thorz Vett, Boloka, and Henrique as the midfielders with Pinamonte up front, Lauriente on his left, and Berardi on his right. Now, around the quarter hour mark, Domenico Berardi released Thor's vet in the box, but Thor's vet shot was straight at Montepo, who parried his attempt away. Consili denied Thomas Suslov and Juan Cabal from a rebound just after 30 minutes into the game, and that would be the end of the first half, which was quite a cagey affair. Mm. Berardi's free kick in the second half curled narrowly past the post. The technique on that was absolutely beautiful and it could have been a mental goal. Yeah. Lauriente and Pinamonti had weak attempts to score. Um, one of them failed to hit the target, the other one was straight at the keeper. And then later on at the hour mark, Montepo played the ball straight to Berardi. It was a massive mistake. Um, Berardi took a touch and went down completely unchallenged, holding his heel. He was forced off the pitch. Um, he was being carried off by two men. He looked to be in a world of pain. Um, and he was replaced by Samu Castillejo. And of course, it's come out now that he's done his Achilles and will be out for the rest of the year. Massive loss for Sassuolo. Massive hit for Berardi and his career. Um, but I do think that thankfully for, for Berardi, next, this, this is probably his last season at Sassuolo. It has so to be. his next team will be a completely new chapter. He can see it as a way to kind of move on from his injuries, mm-hmm. to move on from his past at Sassuolo and to finally um, enter a new phase in his career. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Henrique lost the ball. (laughs) This was in the 79th 79th minute, of course. He had the ball right, not even in front of the defence. He was the last man. (laughs) And he lost the ball to Zvidersky, who had just come on. Um, Zvidersky played a lovely one too with Bonazzoli. Bonazzoli's pass had the perfect amount of weight on it. Simple, but, but you need to get it perfectly done in that situation. Zvidersky carried the ball well and finished past Consigli. Could have done a lot better. Um, to score and open his account for Hellas Verona. The Polish hitman gets his first goal in Serie A. Um, that pretty much secured a vital 1-0 victory um, for <laughs> for Verona. Consili joined the attack late on, but it was all in vain. Bro, Sassuolo have lost Berardi. Are they fucked? What do you think? <sighs> to a degree, Yes. And the reason I say to a degree yes is because I bet one of the reasons that they got Ballardini on board is to help them out defensively while they can have confidence in players like Berardi and Lauriante exactly. to keep things sexy and fresh up front. Kind of like what Napoli tried to do with with um, um, Madonna. Market Samazzitelli, what's his uh, name? Mazzari. Mazzari. Yeah. <laughs> that always happens to me, bro. Those you three. You started mentioning Frosinone. <laughs> <players. laughs> <laughs> it's like what they try to do, right? They get someone to sort out their defensive issues and they let Guevara or Simen and Politano do whatever they want, yeah. basically, um, up front. Unfortunately, now they're not going to be able to do that. Samu Castillejo is way less effective than Domenico Berardi. He's not a goal scorer. Um, he's not even that good, if I'm yeah, being completely yeah, yeah. honest. Castillejo he leaves so much, so much. To be desired. Um, Some muscle to begin with, especially, man, because he gets nudge yeah. of the ball so easily. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, bro, draws aren't quite going to cut it. Draws are not going to cut it. Draws aren't going to... It's unlikely that draws are going to take them out of the relegation battle. Look at what Cagliari are doing. You know, th- these teams are starting to win now. Um, it's sink or swim. They can still get it done because on paper they still have a better team than a lot of these teams. And the fixtures aren't too bad. They play Frosinone next and that's a direct clash. That's another six-pointer. I'm they cancelling need... any plan I have to watch that game. They need to beat them. They need to beat them. Then they play Roma, then Grant. Then they have Udinese and Salernitana. So win these next four games, granted, <laughs> by Roma, they need to pick up points. They're or all five. relegation yes, six-pointers. All of them, bro. All of them. Um, after that, they play Milan. They play Lecce, 
Fiorentina, Inter, Genoa, Cagliari in the penultimate game of the season, and then Lazio in the last match of the season. My God, the Mape so, is going to be full of Cagliari fans. Yeah. For that. <laughs> <laughs> That might that might play a massive part uh, in the fact Huge. that you look around the relegation pool. Most of these teams have a backing. The weakest when it comes to the fan base would be Sassuolo and probably Udinese, dude. Yeah, probably, probably you you'd, you could see their beautiful. You could always see their beautiful seats in yeah. the Dacia. They make them colorful. So yeah, yeah, their yeah. Fans <laughs> the team, you know? Like wow, look at all those fans in different colors. <laughs> But this is this is getting mad juicy, man. Especially with Berardi's injury. Like, what's Ballardini gonna do? What's the plan now? I I don't know, bro. I don't know what like, other options he, do they have over but, there. There's really many. It's bro- custom, Maybe yeah, by Rami. By Rami yeah, isn't he could, bad. He could. By Rami has experience, and and he's got close ball control. He's creative. Mm-hmm. He can do something. Um, Defrel, I guess, <clears throat> is deployable ish. But then the thing is, Pinamonti is also kind of ass when he's not. You know yes, what I mean? Yes. Like, he's he's definitely um, a shadow of his former Empoli self, and even Laurent has been kind of poor as well. Um, yeah, I think it's gonna take individuals to bail the Sassuolo team out. I mean, they lost this game because of an individual mistake. Because yeah. other than that, Ballardini did actually steady the ship. You know, mm. Hellas Verona didn't really threaten apart from that. That one moment, uh, that one lapse in concentration for Henrika, by the way, yeah. who I'm sure hasn't made eye contact with any of his teammates since. <laughs> but man, yeah, that was an absolutely um, fun game to watch. Um, Berardi looked like he was going to get it done for them before he went off. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, Sassuolo are currently in 19th with 20 points, while Hellas Verona are in 17th with 23 points. That's a relegation six-pointer. If we've ever seen yes, one. Yes, and man, like Verona, for the amount of players... We all, we always say this, right? But for mm. the amount of players they've lost, not only across the last five years, but this season and the current financial state that the club is in, for them to keep on managing to get these results, these important results, Baroni has done God's work with this team. Hats off to Baroni, man. Absolutely. Um, I, I do take my hat off to, to Baroni. Suslov, Serdar, Duda, Lazovic, Henry, Noslin. You know what I mean? They, they've got relegation written all over them. Yeah, um, and if you look at, um, by the way, Marco Baroni's career, interestingly enough, Mm. Um, he's managed quite a few teams at uh, the 60 year old. In, he, in 2013, was in charge of Juventus's under 19s, which mm. is really weird because he took this job after he was the head coach of Cremonese and Sutterol. Yeah. So, so it was quite a, an, an odd mm. job to take on. Spent some time there, went to Pescara, Novara, Benevento, Frosinone, Cremonese, Reggio Calabria, Lecce, and now he's at Hellas Verona. Um, where to be honest, yes, he's doing a very impressive job with what he has available. Yeah, just to make you guys aware, before we obviously get into the rest of the relegation six pointers, Lecce in 13th are on 25 points, Cagliari in 18th are on 23. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with. All the teams involved in the relegation battle are Lecce, Empoli, Udinese, Frosinone, Verona, Cagliari, Sassuolo, Salernitana. So yes, it's it's so it's exciting, juicy. man. Empoli nil, Cagliari won. That 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 was a shock. That was a shock result because Empoli have been on fire. They're- I was worried, huh? Because uh, I I I'm all for Cagliari surviving. I yes. really want Cagliari to survive because Salernitana are going down. So we need like another kind of you know seaside vibe, kind of and hardcore, passionate fans, bro. rough, rough. Yes. And I love Cagliari, and I, I do wish that they, they say about Empoli were in such good form. Like you said, bro, with David and Nicola, I thought they were going to beat Six them for Six games sure. undefeated. Yeah. That, and think of the dreadful start they had, bro. They were lost for a while. like They, they were terrible. Um, but yeah, Nicola managed to do a fantastic job. But now, Cagliari, here we go. This is Nicola's first loss with Empoli, um, but not her first loss with Dale. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Malta Love Island. Love pun. Island, Malta, baby. Um, Empoli coming off, are coming off um, a 3 2 away win over Sassuolo. Um, another relegation six pointer over there. And Cagliari coming off a 1 1 draw to Napoli. Remember that? Zito Lovumbo yeah. um, in the last minute. Previous encounter was Cagliari nil, Empoli nil. 
Now, Empoli were on a fantastic run since Davide and Nicola took charge, winning three and drawing three. Jassi returned from suspension and Zurkowski was once again available, but Caputo and Grassi were still not fully fit. The Sardinians had a lengthy absentee list, including Pavoletti, Mancozu, Sulemana, Hatsidiakos and Petania. 4-3-1 formation for Nicolas men, um, with Caprile in goal and the back line of Ismaili, Valukevic, Luperto and Kakace. Kovalenko, Marin and Male being the midfield three with Cancelleri and Cambiaghi flanking Mattia Destro. 4-4-1-1 formation there for Cagliari, um, Scuffe and goal on the back line of Nandes, Mina, Dossena and Augello. Yankto, Makumbu, Deola and Luvumbo playing in midfield with Gaetano playing behind La Padula. Now in the 16th minute, Empoli charged forward on a counter-attack after advantage was played after a foul on Cancelleri. Cambiaghi broke forward well and squeezed through a shot which hit the post and fell straight to Male, who took way too long to shoot the rebound to put the ball on his favourite foot um, and he was subsequently denied by Scuffe. Caprile got down well to deny La Padula a header on the 43rd minute. In the 52nd minute... Empoli were bizarrely not awarded a penalty after a clear handball by Mukumbu in the area. <laughs> the VAR room did not instruct the ref to take a look. Bro, penalty like. Clear as day. He was like this, which is technically his hand against his body, mm. but is it? No, his it's hand is extended, up. Yeah. His hand is up and it hit like. It, chop his arm off it would have gone through chop his arm mm. off and it would have gone through penalty not given you know why you know why because we have absolutely fucked <laughs> the, the handball yes. rule yes. we fucked the, the pen- penalties rule. in general man they're Ma, the worst part of the like, sport at the moment what the hell that was that was a penalty in my opinion mm. again come at me um 64th minute Kakache's powerful rebounded goal was ruled out for offside due to the initial strike coming from an offside position. He hit that violently. He New, did, New Zealand. Libby, Libby wanted it. Libby wanted to spank that. In the 69th minute, Yankto scored to get the winner for Cagliari, totally against the run of play, by the way. Um, they took the lead through a young talk, clean rebound into the bottom corner. To be honest, not even a rebound. The keeper was well in position by then. Zappa did incredibly well to create the chance, not making the defender. Um, and he played through Nandes, who took the initial strike before the ball landed to young to. Um Cagliari managed to hold on, despite Empoli really looking to get the equalizer. And Scuffe had a brilliant save in the 95th minute to secure the win for Cagliari. This is, fun fact, Cagliari's first away win of the season. And that's what Costa. Huh? This is another relegation side who've lost a very important player, bro. Zito Luvumbo. Absolutely. Went off injured in the 30th minute. And he'll be out for three weeks. You're right, bro. You're right. I forgot to mention it's that. It's okay. It's okay. Bro, he went out. He's He was off in the 30th minute. And the, the hope for Ranieri is to have him back against Verona on the 1st of April. Ma- and now this is... Honestly, I might stop watching you the top teams right and just, just watch, watch the, the relegation games right now. Because they, they are so interesting, man. So, basically, Cagliari need to find a way without their best player by far. Mm. You know? Um... I, I don't know, man, how, how they can do it. The next two games for them are are pivotal as well. They're vital. Um, you look at the they have Salernitana next, <sighs> which they have to they have to win. They, they have, have to. to win, and then Monza right after. So they're two technically winnable games. So, so yeah, they're gonna miss Zito Lovumbo definitely. But Gaetano has been a revelation. Huh? Ah, Gaetano has given them some creativity. They always kind of struggled to get the ball into the box and to score goals and to create chances. But Gaetano, he's got some good footwork. He's very attacking minded and he's really linking up the midfield to those big strikers quite well or big striker rather because it was just La Padula up front now mm. and to be honest I kind of like this before they always played with two big strikers to win those physical battles with not much going on behind them unless they bring on Zito Luvumbo 
But now, in the case of Sisi Tolovumbo is out injured, I think this is the way to go because Gaetano can really do a lot for them. Ah, position. and then he operates um, centrally, usually, of course, um, or has been lately. But after Zito went off injured, mm-hmm. he really filled in that pocket on the left side. And uh, I think that might be the way forward for them for now against mm-hmm. Salernitana and Monza. They might want to, they might want to start off with Gaetano on the left. Maybe mm. you know, kind of a four four three three or something, four two three one, something like that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I'm sure Ranieri will think of something. <laughs> uh-huh. I think Cagliari what they did here is they, they made themselves uh, as annoying to play against as possible. Mm. They were very pragmatic, they broke down Empoli's play by piling all their men back and ensuring that Empoli weren't gonna get a sniff. Empoli, because they're very fast, fluid and direct nowadays. They got their opportunities, they were met with a bit of misfortune, they were also met with some heroics by Scoffet. But to me, the, the man of the match, the, the the guy that had the best performance for Cagliari, the reason they won this game, in my opinion, is Dossena, apart from the mm. referee, <laughs> uh, naturally. But Dossena had 10 air, aerial duels won, um, and he was just solid as a rock at the back. Yerimina had a good performance as well. Naturally, Scuffe, like I mentioned before. But these are the heroic performances that can change everything. And this is what I like, bro. This is what I like about relegation battles. This result not only has... Not only plays a massive part for the teams involved, but the other teams in the relegation battle that see Cagliari getting major three points over there, it's like um, like a psychological awakening. They say, okay, we need to get our shit together because they're they're doing it and we have to as well. So massive implications for the entire relegation battle. Absolutely, man. And it's crazy how different each team in this um, relegation battle is, by the way. You Mm -hmm. look at, for example, who do you think has the fewest wins in Serie A this season? Um, I think... Think, bro, Udinese, genuinely. So it's Salernitana with two, and then right off them is Udinese, who have only won three games this Crazy. season. They have 15 draws and yes. nine losses. Like, that that's that's mental. absolutely wild, you know? And then you look at, for example, Cagliari, who are very similar to, for example, Verona and Sassuolo and Frosinone. They have five wins, eight draws, 14 mm. losses. That's usually the case, you know? So Udinese being down there with 15 draws is, is really weird. And um, them not having won many games might actually bite them in the ass when it comes to this this relegation battle. Yeah, we could potentially see, by the way, three teams getting relegated, but none of them are newcomers. Uh, yeah, it could easily be Sassuolo, Udinese, Salernitana. Fucking mental, bro. Yeah. Mental. Let's jump on to the next ones when it comes yeah. to the standings for these teams uh, Cagliari now in 18th on 23 points level on points with Verona who are also on 23 in 17th place Empoli in 14th on 25 points you'd think 14th would be somewhere near <laughs> the realms of safety but not at all man not at all bro. The next game is Udinese 1, Salernitana 1. Speaking of Udinese not being able to win games and just drawing every single game. <laughs> These are the two teams which combined have five victories this season. Yeah, Really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the previous encounter was, a, was another 1-1 one, one draw. Um, this was back in August and Dia and Samard scored. Um, just an update on Dia if you're wondering where, where the hell's Dia been. Mm. Dia has fallen out with the management yet again Mm -hmm. he refused to come on this game and he's training separately so that's a shame that's a real shame for Bulay Edia not really giving himself a a good advertisement over there for any teams who will be looking for him yeah Um, he's just telling you basically when the going gets tough I'm gonna leave (laughs) exactly Exactly. But yeah. Udinese lined up with their 3 5 1 1 formation with Maduka, Okoye in goal, Ferreira, Gianetti, and Perez as the defenders, with Kamara and Abosello on the flanks. Loveridge, Wallace, and Piero were in the middle, with Tuvan playing behind Lorenzo Lucca. For Salernitana, it was a 4 3 1 2 formation with Ochoa and goal, Brotherich on the left, and Zanoli on the right, with Pellegrino and Manolas as the centre back partnership. Bazic, Major, and Kulabali were in the middle with Kandreva playing behind Visman and Chuna. Can, can I just make like just a quick observation slash question? Why the fuck doesn't Samardzic start? <laughs> Why the fuck doesn't Samardzic start? He um, must be a real asshole. 
Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know why he didn't start this game. I guess he must have not been in the best condition because I, I can assure you the coach would want him on the pitch. Um, he didn't even come on. So, so yeah, there's definitely some, some injury problem over there, some attitude problem. Um, or the fact that, again, he must be... On, he, he is on yeah. his way out. He's going to be at where next season? Juve, Inter, who knows? But no, Inter fell through. So Napoli, maybe, I Napoli, think. Napoli. Instead yeah. of Zielinski. Ah, yes. yes. But, yeah. Yeah, I know. three wins all I season. Know. Fucking shut up and play him. But Thuvan is, was fucking excellent, to be honest. Uh-huh, they uh-huh. didn't miss him. Yeah. Um, the missing players for both teams, of course, Jerome Boateng is injured for Salernitana. A really good buy over there. <laughs> Fazio, Gyomber, Pierotzi and Pirola all injured for Salernitana. It's a bit of a defensive crisis for them. Biol, De Olofeu, Ebosse and Christensen were out for Udinese. Apparently, De Olofeu, a man, might be done forever. Might be done right? forever. Which is very Shame. Really he's, shame. He's not old, man. Not old at all. Um, yeah. Chuna scored a stunning left-footed strike 10 minutes in, giving Salernitana a 1-0 lead. Bend it like Chuna, bro. That would have been the episode title of it, weren't for Bello Bellissimo. Chew it like Chuana. There we go. He tried the exact same curler with his right earlier on. Um, I was going to praise him for scoring with his weaker left, but turns out he's left-footed. So mm. the first attempt was with his weaker right. Yeah, Wait, this is who's saying it correctly? Chuana or Chuna? Um, I, I think it's Chuana, Chuna, Chuana, Chuna. I don't know. There's the A before everything else. There's Chauna, 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 Chauna. Yes, Payero played a brilliant ball to Luca after Ebosele had charged down the the right hand side and squared it to him. Luca tried to guide it into the back of the net. Um, he kind of mishit it, to be honest. And Ochoa got down fast enough to grab the ball. Still, a, still an impressive save by Ochoa, but at the end of the day, it was a mishit shot by Luca. In the 38th minute, Sandy Lovrich missed a golden opportunity to equalize after a lovely flick on by Lovrich, I wrote over here. So um, it must be Thuvan. <laughs> Thuvan, I assume, flicked it over to Loverish. That's my mistake. In the 46th minute at the end of the first half, Hassan Kamara scored an incredible goal, our goal of the week. Um, Thuvan crossed the ball behind him and he bicycle kicked it acrobatically into the back of the net. Great goal over there to get his um, first goal in Serie A and his first goal for Udinese. Thuvan hit a free kick in the second half, low and hard, and it went narrowly wide. He picked out Kamara shortly after in a fantastic position right in front of the goalkeeper. The guy had just scored an acrobatic goal. You, you could swear he was going to score this one. But the Ivorian 29-year-old shot it over the bar, disappointingly. In the 60th minute, Festi Ebosele received a second yellow card and was sent off after a foul on Pellegrino. It was one of those fouls where the offender was in possession of the ball. So Ebosele had the ball, but his touch was too heavy. And to try to recover it, he took Pellegrino out, who had put himself between the man and the ball. And he got sent off. So that's one way of being punished for your crappy yeah. first touch, right? <laughs> Chuana hit the post, or Chauna, Chauna, let's call him Chauna, or Loom, his first name is Loom. I like so, Loom. 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 Loom hit the post with a close range effort after being played in by Kondreva. Another situation where the touch was too heavy, and another situation where a guy who scored um, a very difficult chance missed quite an easy one. Mm. And that was basically everything, and the match ended 1-1, giving them one point each. This was the chance for Salernitana to get a victory. Odinese were a man down for 30 minutes. They had many moments where they were outnumbering the Udinese defense, but they simply didn't have enough in their locker. And I think that <clears throat> Salernitana are done for, man. It's going to take a massive sequence of events. Two seasons ago. I know, yes. That's what I said. Two seasons ago. And they didn't go down. And they were, believe me, I believe they were in a worse situation than they are now. At least three fucking wins can take them to 12th at this, at this point. They need nine points, man. Nine and, they, points. and the teams in front of them all have to lose. Like, yeah. no, I, I, I wouldn't even hint at the fact that they might survive. Look, they're probably, they're probably down. Which, which, my God, is it sad? Because they, they have so much character as a team. Their, their fans are amazing, and I fell in love with some of these players as well, man. Like Kandreva just being an icon of that team along with Ochoa. Even Sabatini coming back and fucking watching the game with an oxygen tank in the in the stands, right, you know, like it's right. It, it's it's more even to the to the city. It's it's more than more than just football. It means a lot to them. 
Um, but unfortunately, man, unfortunately, if there's 30 minutes left of play and you're down against 10 men and you... I don't be too harsh and say if you can't get it done, then, yeah. you know, because it's easy to put fucking nine men back and, and you prevent a goal. And I don't want to be too harsh by saying this is a bad result for Salah and Etana because these games... The relegation six pointers are typically the ones, bro, where you get one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. both teams are a little bit cagey. Maybe, okay, Salernitana should not have been that cagey, but they're playing against Udinese that are serial drawers. Yeah. They know how to get one point out of the game. They're a tough side, though, Udinese, but when you're a man up, you have to get it done. Um, mm. And they're very physical as well. They have always been a very mm-hmm. physical team, man, Udinese. And to Udinese's credit, of course, Tuvan was incredible this game. He really showed us what he can do. Mm. He was everywhere, man. He was taking shots. He was playing players in. You know, He was by far the man of the match for mm-hmm. me this game. It's interesting when you look at the way the game went down as well. Um, if you look at the stats... So 50-50% ball position, 18 shots to Udinese, 17 to Salernitana, okay, five of Udinese's were on target, whereas one was on target for Salernitana, that must have been the goal. One shot on target, man, come on. Um, In the first half, it was 10-4 to when it comes to shots in favour of Udinese. The second half, which is probably as a result of the red card, eight shots to 13 in (laughs) favour of Salernitana, so... You know, quite it, it quite a predictable quite mm. quite a predictable way in which the game went down. Yeah, man. And Liverani was brought in to kind of impose his offensive style, right? Mm. It's this is what happens when you change coach, man. You're either gonna end up like De Rossi. What happened with De Rossi? Mm. To be fair, the caliber of players is much better. Uh-huh. For the Rossi, so it's more likely to happen. But that's Salah and Etana changing the coach so frequently. We we keep we keep banging on the same the same point, man. It just didn't make any sense. I think they would have a much better chance of surviving had they kept Nzagi and they would have had more points as well. Because granted it wasn't a particularly offensive brand, but they really steadied the ship and he almost got it done against big teams towards Yeah, it's the end. a marathon, not a sprint eh? exactly. at the end of the day. And okay. Fucking two seasons ago, their third manager is the one that fucking saved them. But football isn't just a replication of what has worked in the past. Exactly. Um, Pippo Nzaki, at the end of the day, he still had over 10 games left. Yes, yes. To sort this shit out. And he was doing well. Like, look, look at this team. It's not great, man. Kandreva playing behind Chauna and Wiesman. Yeah. You know? But he was managing to utilize his players at least effectively. He was Simi. Yes, he was using Simi as his first defender up front, pressing, cutting the channels. He was really closing teams off mm. like that. You know, so, so you're getting rid of defensive solidarity for a manager who prioritizes offensive football, and then you can't even beat Udinese or a man down mm. for 30 minutes. It's just, it's not Salernitana's year. It doesn't seem like it. If there's another miracle, I'm, I'm all for it. Fuck Literally. it, let's go. Se qual è la squadra del mio cuore, si che lo so alla Salernitana and all that, but yeah, that's... Maybe if Pippo was there, Dia would still be playing. If Pippo yeah. was like, listen bro, like, shut the fuck up, play for me. Yeah. Next year, I'll speak to Milan for you. <laughs> I'll speak to Juve for you. We'll, we'll sort it out. Like, shut up and play, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Shame, shame mm. they brought in Liverani. <laughs> but yes, um, Salernitana are dead last with 14 points, while Udinese are in 15th with 24 points, 10 points ahead. The final relegation six pointer we're going to speak about. My God, blessed were we, blessed were we blessed last were we, weekend. Frosinone won, Lecce won. Frosinone were coming off a feisty 3 2 loss to Juve, while Lecce were coming off a not so feisty 4 0 home loss to Winter. The previous encounter was a 2-1 victory for Lecce. Now, this was a potentially crucial opportunity to break away from the danger zone, as you guys know, as these teams were separated by one point going into this weekend. Frosinone were in horrific form after four consecutive defeats and missing Markitsa, Oyono, Bonifazi and Kalai. Um, Lecce had Pongracic and Dorgu back from suspension, but Dermaku is a long-term absentee. Um, they lost eight of the last ten games that they played, beating only Fiorentina 3-2. That is a crazy, crazy stat. 4-4-2 for Frosinone with Cerofolini in goal, who had a 
whirlwind of a performance in this game. <laughs> Backline of Valeri, Romagnoli, Ocoli and Zortea, midfield of Gelli, Brescianini, Mazzitelli and Sole, with Harrui and Walid Kedira starting up front. 4-2-3-1 for Lecce, with Falcone and goal. Backline of Jean Dre, Pongracic, Baskirotto and Gallo, pivot of Kaba and Ramadani, Alnqvist and Banda on the wings, with Rafia playing behind Kristovic. On the 25th minute, Kristovic had a chance to score but was denied well by Cerafolini. In the 47th minute, stoppage time of the first half, Kedira managed to get his second goal in as many games. Um, there was some chaos in the box, which is basically what we say when there are too many things to describe, and including Falcone misjudging across ever so slightly, and Kedira was there to hoof the ball into the back of the net. Um, well, I say two goals in two games, the last one was against Juve. Um, which is great. In the 56th minute, Lecce were awarded a penalty after a horrible back pass by Zortea left Cerafolini with no choice other than to bring down Kristovic. Um, Cerafolini saved Rafia's initial penalty well, but this had to be retaken due to encroachment. This time, Kristovic stepped up. Cerafolini went the right way. Kristovic hit the post. The ball bounced off the post, hit Cerafolini in the back, and went into the back of the net. So, Cerafolini gave away a penalty. Not his fault, but he gave away a penalty. Imagine having this guy on Fanta. <laughs> he gave away a penalty. <laughs> saved one. It got cancelled. And then he scored an own goal. Yeah. By tracking a penalty a bit too well, he ended up scoring That's an own goal. brutal for anyone who had him on Fanta. Brutal, brutal, brutal. bro. Personally, I had Kristovic. That was also brutal. That was brutal. Yeah. Having Kristovic in general is devastating. <laughs> Not for the first four games, baby. Riding <laughs> off the high, riding off the high. In the 64th minute, Jelly hit the crossbar with a reaction strike. Uh, moments later, Brescianini had his goal disallowed for an for an offside um, as he met Kedira's through ball. Also have him on Fanta. And in the 96th minute, Falcone expertly denied Kedira's header, tipping the ball over the bar. Now... To me, in this game, Frosinone were simply very, very unlucky. So there was the whole penalty situation. That's how Lecce got their goal, right? So Frosinone took the lead just before half time. Crucial. Lecce's equalizer came from a penalty which, despite initially being saved, um, was retaken and it went in off the back of their goalkeeper. Um, they then hit the crossbar in the 64th minute and then they had a disallowed goal. Brescianini's goal was disallowed. And then the 96th minute, Falcone produced a fantastic save um, to secure the draw for Frosinone. Unfortunate for Frosinone mm-hmm. in this game. I would go so far as to say they were unlucky. I, I would say so too, man. Um, they were they were pretty good. They dominated Lecce as they were always going to do, to be honest. Um, a draw, to be honest, is is probably not too unfair result though, because Lecce did put in quite a quite a decent performance, especially when it came to creating as well. You know, mm-hmm. um, granted, Frosinone were peppering the goal, you know, seven shots on target to Lecce's four, but um, ah, the spoils were shared, and um, I'm sure both would be happy with it before they had heard about Cagliari and Verona both winning. Yeah, because now it's looking. It's looking a bit dangerous for them as well. When all of a sudden, you know, they're on 25 points and 24 points and then Cagliari in the relegation pool are on 23rd, for example, in that 18th spot. So uh um, I'm sure they would have been happy that they didn't lose, but worried that they didn't win. Mm. It has been a while since Frosinone have won a game, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. them, as well as Sassuolo, as well as Salernitana. Um, Those are the ones just don't seem able to get three points at the moment. But there's something to me that I have conflicting opinions on Frosinone, man. Because there's one that to me says the most simple way to explain football to a child, to whatever, is if you don't concede, you can't lose. Yeah. Right? But then I'm also a massive fan, a massive fan of attacking football, fucking going balls deep into teams, right? Unfortunately, Frosinone have the latter, but their defense is among the worst I have seen in the league. <laughs> they course. have, in fact, conceded 56, 56 goals, goals the, the most. most 
more yeah. than Sassuolo on 55 and more than Salernitana on 54. Yeah, they they just devastating. They just attack everyone in their sight, man. These guys, um, which is fun. It's a breath of fresh air. It's fun to watch, you know, for a team that's just come up. And I do hope they they survive so they can strengthen and maybe, you know, um, solidify a bit at the back going into next season. We'll see what they can do mm. with better. Do you know what hurts personnel. me? What if they survive? They don't have any of the same players they do now because everyone is on loan, bro. At yeah. Them. Everyone is on loan. Yeah, it would be, it would be interesting to see what happens. They'll probably just loan in more people, man. You know, just keep probably bringing in people on loan and trying to survive like that. But I fucking like, I like teams with their players. Yeah, of course. You know what course, I mean? Like, like I, I can't root for Frozenone too much when Sole is gonna be back at Juve. Um, if can they keep him. If, if, which they probably will, bro, considering Chiesa and his and his injuries. But basically, everyone, Ocoli with Atalanta, um, Zorte as well, Reiner with with Real Madrid, Carri, George Berenice, all of them. <coughs> you know, so yeah. I I can't get behind this team too much, but I do think that out of the bottom tier teams, they are the ones that can bring it mm-hmm. the most. They can turn it up. They can go forward. The most, just unfortunately, they are incredibly compromised. Yeah, they're very, they very similar this season to Sassuolo. Exactly, very, very similar. Yes, bro. in the fa- it's it's almost uncanny. Frosinone have scored thirty five goals. Sassuolo have scored thirty two. Frosinone mm. have conceded fifty six. Sassuolo have, have conceded fifty five. Frosinone have won six games. Sassuolo have won five. <laughs> Frosinone have drawn six. Sassuolo have drawn five. They're having a very, very similar season, man. Yeah, man. And and guess what? Di Francesco, right? The, yeah, the, <laughs> the common the common factor. That's that's a, an interesting point, that's true. Mm. But but aha, yeah. uh-huh, like I, I don't think there's too much to add on this game. Looking at Lecce's chances on the other hand, Lecce are up there in thirteenth, you know, but on twenty five points, so two points from from the drop, um, which is not not safe in the slightest. I would say that Lecce are the team that have regressed the most. Since the start? Yes. They always do this, man. You don't remember our episode title, Let's Share Fourth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had a great start when Alnqvist was backflipping into a, into a fucking golf, golf swing. swing. Yeah. Gone, gone is that Lecce. Yeah, gone is that Lecce. Gone is that Lecce. They are suffering quite, quite a bit. And unfortunately, it's been a while since their last... Victory as well. Um, it was one, two, three, four, five games ago. Was their was their last victory? Yeah, that that can that can happen. Uh, they probably felt safe for the vast majority of the season because of this strong start. But suddenly, you know, with twenty seven matches played, they're in the thick of it, man. They really need to find their winning ways again and realize what it was at the beginning mm-hmm. of the season that was clicking, and why Kristovic was scoring and now he isn't, and why is it that when you play Piccoli he does nothing and Kristovic does better when he comes on and vice versa? <laughs> I'm like fuck, fuck, fuck! What the hell? What the hell are you gonna do, man? But fortunately now they've got Pongracic back as well. Yeah, um, that's the horse massive for them. The horse, yeah. So absolutely well not too much to add from my end about this mm-hmm. game let's turn 13th on 25 points whereas Frosinone are in 16th on 24 points yes we have a nil nil now to discuss it was Torino against Fiorentina and finally we can I can tell you what Juric told Italiano oh my god I've been waiting this entire it's time it's been it's been what two hours mm, two hours um, and one minute yes they had a heated debate a heated mm-hmm. argument quite frankly and Juric told him, I'm going to slit your throat to Italiano. Yeah. He got sent off, obviously. <laughs> he's he's but probably probably you, say you, now, can't, you can't you threaten. Can't threaten. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, literally, he ripped out that page of the room, put it in his pocket. He's like, how am I going to get myself sent off? I am going to slit your throat. Like, yeah, I'm going to fucking slit your throat. Take it man. down a notch. I'm yeah. going to headbutt you. I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm going to fuck you yeah. up. People make that's me, fine. People make me laugh, man, when they have absolutely no control over what comes out of their mouth. <laughs> they make me laugh so much, especially when you're angry. Like, it's you a deal, deal. Yeah, it's <laughs> we told you not fair to that bros going out wanting to slit people's throats. So yeah, like, yes, what man. was said before that? that? That's what I want to know. Like, why did he tell him that? What do you think Italian could have possibly said to him? 
you know, but but yeah, um, when it comes to the the lineups, it was a three four one two for Torino with Vanya in goal, Gigi Bongiorno and Masina at the back with Bellanova and Rodriguez on the flanks, Ilic Lunetian Vlasic in the middle with Sanabria and Zap. Zapata playing up front. I was going to say Zapacosta. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Zapacosta playing up front. <laughs> Bellotti was up front for Fiorentina in their 4 2 3 1 formation. Terraciano was in goal. Biragi, Ranieri, Milenkovic, and Kayo. They were at the back with Arthur and Bonaventura as a double pivot. Sotil on the left, Gonzalez on the right, and Beltran playing behind, of course, Il Gallo. Well, Aventura has become. They've put them more and more defensive as the season ah, progressed. Ah, They're liking the... Beltran in this creative role. I think it makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense because Beltran has good qualities to be a 10 despite wearing mm-hmm. the number 9 on his shirt which drives me insane. <laughs> um, but if we're in a double pivot I'm not too sure about. Um, uh-huh. Nothing against uh-huh. his work ethic but he's on the older side and you need a lot of energy to balance yeah. a double pivot. Yeah. But yes, um, the first half Illich went off injured in 10 minutes. Um, Richie came on as his replacement and um, I bet they'd be regretting that <laughs> Nico Gonzalez failed to hit the target on a free header very unlike him in the 38th minute Zapata had a goal disallowed for a foul in the build-up play which was absolutely hilarious have you seen this? bro the ball came over the top Duvan Zapata jumped up in the air like the ball's nowhere near them yet and he has Milinkovic in front of him he jumps in the air and as he's landing he just pushes Milinkovic back <laughs> Controls the ball, shoots and scores. Like well, I think people forget that they're being filmed. <laughs> Zapata has a hilarious play, stri- play style, bro. Because yeah. he's, a, he's a bulldozer. Even yeah. earlier on in the 16th minute, he got the ball and Arthur was on him. And he just went on this marauding run, bro, down the left side. He cut inside. Arthur is trying his best, just slapping him. You know, <laughs> it comes to a point where the defender is just slapping yeah, the man. Yeah. Um, he cuts inside, he shoots, but he um, failed to hit the target. He skied it. Yeah, um, Samuel Ricci um, elbowed Nico Gonzalez in the face and got a yellow card. Very unlucky that it wasn't more, maybe, because mm-hmm. some referees nowadays <laughs> bella bellissimo. <laughs> Shortly after, he was um, fouled. Richie and he started shouting at the referee telling him like what the fuck are you doing book him you book me don't book him you fucking asshole and he got another yellow card and was sent off Bravo. for this end leaving Torino with 10 men at half time in the second half Raul Bellanova's shot was stopped well by Terraciano following a fast break um, Genetis was really smooth on the counter over there mm. In the 60th minute, Bonaventura's header was well saved by Vanya. Um, this was Fiorentina's first shot on target in the 60th minute. In the 75th minute, Zapata headed wide from a corner, missing a chance to um, secure an unlikely victory at that point because they were a man down. Juric was sent off. Gonzalez tried to curl one in. In the end, it was well saved by Vanya. And that was pretty much curtains for the game, which ended in um, a feisty argument between uh-huh. the managers. I mean, definitely, this game definitely showcases how, despite bringing Bellotti on board and having Nico Gonzalez back in the side, Fiorentina still struggled to get goals, right? Now, mm-hmm. Torino are a tough team defensively to play against. Of also, course. we saw Ricardo Rodriguez returning to left wing back, which is interesting over here. That's more defensive, right? Isn't yeah. It? And I think it balances out well with the form Bellanova has been on. Yeah, Bellanova's obviously... You know, and, and and Gigi I think often covers for Bellanova mm-hmm. and then Bonjourna and Mazina, centre backs and Rodriguez on the left. That's typically how the setup would be. Um but Torino are very tough to penetrate. Um yes. but Fiorentina with the, the caliber that they want to be, you know, the way they started the season, the way they keep improving from season to season. You look a few seasons ago. 15th, 14th, mm-hmm. and they've managed to climb all the way up to where they are now. Conference League final last year. They were in two domestic finals as well. Unfortunately, this year, there, there's a significant problem when it comes to scoring goals, mm-hmm. when it comes to their flow and creativity. And that's highlighted here. When you have an entire half to score one against Torino, like, come on. Against 10 man Torino. Against 10 man Torino. String but something that's, together, that's, pull a Hail Mary. They've that's got... the interesting thing, bro, about this. Torino's main strength is their defense. Fiorentina's main weakness at the moment is scoring goals. Yeah. So I guess this was always going to be the case. In the reverse fixture, I don't even think I mentioned that back in December, it took a run near a late winner for mm. Fiorentina to win one, mm. for example. So they were always going to struggle over here, especially away to Torino. Um, Bellotti's just come in. 
Belt, like Bellotti is the new boy, but Beltran in reality is also a new boy. It's his first mm. bloody season, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they just haven't got it right with strikers, man, and it, um, and it's <laughs> it's really hammering them. Eh? It's really fucking uh-huh. them. They need to, I think, move one kind of level up when it comes to their signings. They seem to be stuck on this twenty, thirty million. Pool uh-huh, of players. Uh-huh. I think if they go for a forty million player, man, you know, just splash a bit. You know, Fiorentina have had success in Europe. They they've consistently qualified for Europe two seasons in a row now, and um, they made a final. Surely, surely, financially, you can afford to to splash a little bit on a striker. Uh-huh, and sometimes they surprise me with the business that they're capable mm-hmm. of doing and some of the talent they they're capable of attracting. Um, with that being said, we need to see a bit of better business. From them, like okay, they made good money off of Vlaovic when they sold him to Juventus. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are some guys here that they could potentially cash in on. Um, unfortunately, when I talk about good business, it mirrors the terrible business that they did in the in the last uh, transfer window, bringing mm-hmm. in the likes of Beltran and Inzola. That's it, and they they keep buying these players, man, from from struggling sides, and it's clearly not working for them, man. Like they brought in Barak, and he hasn't been the same. Barak no. was amazing at Hellas Verona. Man. He, he was they, unbelievable. They brought in Maxim Lopez from Sassuolo, has barely played. You know, they brought in Inzola from Spezia. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's they've they've not been successful in the market. They've been quite unlucky, and I I, I don't think that they're doing terribly. Granted, I think Italiano's doing. A pretty decent job, but there are definitely limit limitations to this team. Mm-hmm. I think, by the way, on the topic before of Bonaventura and the pivot with Beltran mm. in the attacking midfield role, I don't like Beltran in the attacking midfield role, bro. I don't think the solution to not scoring goals is tossing another striker out of position at all. I don't think that's the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, I much prefer the balance the team has when either Duncan or Mandragora uh, is again, playing alongside Arthur. Absolutely. I, I do agree with that. I like a midfield three on Fiorentina. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's everything, man. Uh, I think I think we just say where they are in the standings. Uh, Balotelli and... um threw a firecracker in Turkey in the dressing room you randomly, like, you know, you have, whatever to. Was, you have to Balotelli do. is in the right place to do crazy shit. Yeah. You, you see what happens in Turkey, it's crazy, bro. Pirlo apparently would be smoking cigarettes when he was coaching there. Well, fucking brilliant, man! And have you heard this as well that um, Spalletti has banned PlayStations from the training camp, from the Italy camps, oh, Why, national man. team duty? He said he wants to bring that like OG mentality back. But the OG mentality, if I recall, Pirlo was playing PlayStation the night before, literally, <laughs> the night before this? the final when they won it. Does he not know what the OG mentality is? The yeah. bro is still young. Like PlayStations yeah. were around in his time. You know what I mean? No, there, there, there are weird extents that that coaches will go through for very superstitious fucking yeah, yeah. reasons, bro. If I know my players are gonna perform well the next, it's not like it's gonna give them an astigmatism and they're gonna <laughs> go out hallucinating. I think it just might keep them up, bro. To be honest with you, these, remember these are hyper competitive athletes who are Brother. young men at the end of the day. They're gonna be playing FIFA all night. You know how you and I are. Imagine them. I used to work night shifts. <laughs> Here we go <laughs> at the Corinthian. <laughs> Okay, na- fucking name and everything. Where the Maltese national team used to stay. And Devis Manja, the coach at the time, until he was sacked, let's put it that way. Um, he and his staff and his team of Italians, they were so strict. Mm-hmm. So strict. They wouldn't let the team out at any cost. They're in their rooms. But they used to play PlayStation. You know, that that's the only thing. The amount of times I got calls from the second floor, because they just used to stay in the second floor, they would, bro, come help me sort out this HDMI shit, and I'll be yeah, in there for 20 minutes fixing, it's, fixing it's up the It's so HDMI. much better to be playing PlayStation in your room than to be out drinking, Literally, trying to get girls. Bro, they, and weren't, all that. they weren't allowed. You know the story. Mm. And I got a player banned for 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 fucking he's a for, rat. for months never because trust he, Matthew. he went out to meet a gialdem on my not not on my watch i'm a football fan i want to see malta thrive baby yeah. so i was like <laughs> devis the spears <laughs> hello mr manjo <laughs> i'm the receptionist i'm tonight on my duty and i couldn't have i couldn't help but notice i'm one of your players sneaking away with a lady 
I was a bit intimidated, so I locked him out, bro. And you I locked him out. I was, and and when he came back, I called. Not it wasn't Davis I was speaking to, but it was the guy that overlooks the accommodation stuff like that. I believe his name was Keith. Um, Keith. And I called him. He'd, he'd, he's always ready. This guy. He's always <laughs> up, ready to go. Before, uh, before, <laughs> like a week before, I went to come up to me. He's like, "Hi, I have like." 2,000 pieces of paper for you to print. Can you do it for me? And it's all tactics of how Norway are going to play. And well, this, uh, just that. to lose 4-0. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. Um, but I, I locked him out so that when I see him coming, he's out. I can call Keith. And then I go up to him and I buy myself some time. Like I'm struggling to open the door or something. Like, And Keith can come down in the meantime. And then I pretended I had to take his temperature. I was like, can you hold on, bro? Because this is during you, COVID. Uh-huh, since yeah. you left and you're coming back in, I need to take your temperature. He's like, please, man. Please, I shouldn't have done this. Like, And I'm feeling bad because I'm looking at him and he's like, a guy similar to my age, he made it like he's playing for Malta kind of kind of thing. And behind me, I just hear Keith's voice. I'm like, I got this guy fucked. The next morning, newspaper, this guy was sent home for disciplinary reasons, bro. There we go, bro. Well done. That's your claim to fame. Huh? That's my claim to fame. <laughs> Basically, maybe you know. You know, you did the right thing, man. I'm fed up. Oh, of the, I'm fed up of the fucking no shit. shit. Like the, the more it was like two, three o'clock in the morning. Yes. There's a game the we next day. We need professionalism, man. You can't just do what you want. What's he gonna start the game? Probably not. Yeah. But Good, I ruined bro. it. Good. Whatever. We've been your hosts, <laughs> Matt and Jake. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week and. We really, really love all of you. Love you guys. Thank you. This is Serie Spotlight. If you like Serie A or have ever liked it in the past, it's a good opportunity for you to listen once a week and you'll get filled in. In the football weekend, that's like the main dish. But then a few days later, you drop your episode and that's like the dessert. And the dessert is just perfect. It's good, the cake. It makes it feel like we're all sitting in a room together, just BSing with each other. The atmosphere is fantastic. I promise nobody will ask you to send boob pics. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. I love how you go into so much detail and show so much passion towards each and every team. Literally, no team is left undiscussed. When I listen to you, it's like I'm talking to you in a pub. It's like I'm chatting to a friend and you're chatting to me.